everybody, welcome to a new episode of the Mid Max Show, a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hansen, joined by Jeff Markiafava on a very special day. That's me. Hello and welcome. We're joined by Kyle Hilliard. Hello. We're joined by Kelsey Lewin. Hi. Welcome. Welcome one and all. Welcome everybody watching. Welcome everybody listening. This is a packed episode of the Min Max Show. Actually, compared to the last couple weeks, it's not that packed, but it's good, I swear. Uh, we're going to be talking <laughs> it's a about... a cozy episode. It, that's the words I was looking for. So we're going to be talking about Unicorn Overlord, the strategy RPG. We're going to be talking about Mars After Midnight, the new game from the creator of Papers, Please and Obra Dinn that you probably haven't played and realistically will never play, but we're going to talk about it. Uh, then we're going to be talking about Llamasoft, the Jeff Minter story, the next documentary video game, talking about Star Wars Dark Forces, that remaster, a uh, bunch of other odds and ends. And then we're going to be talking about um, Akira Toriyama's impact on the game industry uh sadly he passed away last week and so we're going to be unpacking the creative dragon ball's impact on games and talking a little bit about just him as a creator overall here but and then of course back after the show community questions people submitted over there on patreon we got uh way too many to count but if i had to count i'd say it's like 130 great questions so thanks everybody for submitting great stuff over there each and every week you genuinely make the show better and that's the goal whatever you want to type in over there that'll make the show better we appreciate it um unicorn overlord i am fascinated by this game for a bunch of different reasons one of them is the name um jeff i'm good name or bad name great name great, great. it's it sticks with you and for like a strategy rpg maybe i'm just kind of I don't know, uh, bummed out by Square's choices recently of Diofield Chronicles and Triangle Strategy versus kind of like a, a wet fart of a name, but Unicorn Overlord, it feels like it's it's extra grabby, you know? You it remember does, this it, one. It does sometimes become overload by the time that last syllable leaves my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I think I like that better. Yeah, I think <laughs> so. Unicorn overload. overload. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. so this is, is it fair to call it a tactics RPG? Because I've also heard it described as like an RTS, which confused me with, in the description here. I, I would say it's more tactics than RTS, but there are RTS elements to it. There are real-time things happening, but you can pause them. So okay. it's not fully real time. You can't pause real life, I guess. So That makes sense. Uh, so it is, <laughs> it's developed by Vanillaware. Um, published by Sega and Atlas, but Vanillaware, it's one of those studios that I've never really clicked with in a big way myself, but the fans of Vanillaware games are passionate. Like, there are definitely people that have been jumping in the comments recently, like, what are you going to talk about, Unicorn Overlord? Oh, crap, it's Kelsey. But just for, for a rundown here, uh, developers of Odin Sphere, Grim Grimoire, Dragon's Crown, 13 Sentinels, which feels like it wasn't too long ago, but Kelsey, what is your history with Vanillaware? It's the Wii game. And Muramasa. it is called Muramasa. Muramasa. Oh, played. right, right, right. What, which one did everybody fall in love with? How have I completely missed this vanilla wear boat? Uh, for me, it was Odin Sphere was the first one I fell in love with. Um, and I actually skipped Muramasa and for absolutely no reason. Like, I think I just didn't notice it coming out. I, I have no idea. Um, but I've played all of the others. Um, Odin Sphere is, just, I mean, the, the obviously the thing that stands out about the vanilla wear games is that they all have this same beautiful art style um that is very i don't know it's it's very iconic and very easy to be like ah yes that's the next vanilla wear and i just automatically get exci excited when i see the next one announced right. but um yeah i i really fell in love with uh, odin sphere love dragon's crown um and then 13 sentinels um not a good name by the way but uh one of my favorite like that's that's in my top that, 10. That's only me, because you dropped the Aegis Rim, Kelsey. If you'd said the full name, 13 mm. Sentinels, Aegis Rim. No, that's worse. <laughs> that's so many. That's too many. That's triangle strategy plus parabolas and <laughs> hexagons. I don't know. But wait, top 10 of all time, you're saying? I think so. Yeah. That's it's, okay. All right. This is making more sense now. Which made this game a very difficult follow-up to it um, because... Uh, I don't, I don't know if we want to get into it already before everyone else has answered there where they started with Vanillaware, but I, I like this game. It's it's hard to follow up to what I think is like a, a masterpiece, though. Right. It, Jeff, um, what's your Vanillaware history? Why are you so excited about this game? Um, I had I had played Muramasa. Uh, that Interesting. Was, that was the one I played the most, and I think Odin Sphere. And so for me, my impression of Vanillaware was that those games certainly have RPG elements to them, but it was more the like 2D action 
actioniness of them that I that I kind of associated with them. I thought, well, th- that's the kind of games that they make. And so right. then when I saw this one, um, and I looked at the trailers for it, and it was like, oh, they're doing like a you know kind of like what looked like a turn based tactical game. And I like those too, so sure, I'll play that. And then when I started, <laughs> I was even more confused because it's because it's not a, it's not a turn based tactical game like a like a lot of them because the because the battles battle themselves. Um, and that's and that's where things got weird for me, but also interesting. Yeah. So the pitch is: imagine a Fire Emblem, but combined with like the Gambit system from Final Fantasy XII, where you're kind of programming how your characters attack. Is that what's happening in Unicorn Overlord? That's a pretty good summary of it. There's a lot of um, like just very nitty gritty positioning of each one of your all the people inside each unit and where you want to stick them and everything. It is. This is a game for tactics nerds like capital Mm -hmm. n nerds and um and again so funny for me coming off of 13 sentinels because that game had tactics in it too that were really easy (laughs) like that was not a difficult or deep tactics game um and so this one having just so many layers and so many different classes to learn about and play around with and um yeah and like the programming um, kind of Final Fantasy XII aspect of it where you can get really, like, this person only attacks the back row, but only when their HP is below 50. Otherwise, you know, like, it's it's very, very... Um, I think a, a very smart person could probably never level up and just speed run through this game if they really, like, were able to put all of those things together perfectly. And I'm not... I'm not that big of a tactics nerd, but I do like it and I'm having fun getting better at it. Yeah. Jeff, you are that level of a nerd. Like you, you're the kind of dork that plays like those programming games. Well, there's, yeah, there's programming games and then there's tactics games and I like both of them. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself super great at tactics games, but this is, this is definitely a different style. They introduce things at a very slow pace to the to the point where like the first couple of battles I was like, wait, what is the game here? Because I'm pretty sure you cannot lose those battles. And it's it's mm-hmm. not until they start layering in different enemy types and different things where it's like, okay, well, these are now flying units and they're going to decimate certain types of units that you have, and you have to use like special abilities, which some things you can kind of trigger outside battle before you begin. You have archers that you can kind of shoot an area of effect onto onto unit onto enemy units and then you go into battle with them and that will kind of soften them up but the yeah once so at first i was like i i don't understand i don't understand kids these days with their Naturally. auto gambit systems and things like that and then when i started looking through i f- i found basically the programming menu where it's like oh okay so like you know like this character will do an will get an extra attack if he kills the person that that he attacks when he attacks. So I want to set him to always attack the person with the lowest amount of HP, presumably because that way he'll be more likely to. And and so like once you once you start figuring that out, once you unlock more unit types because they kind of there's a there's a slow trickle for that as well and you start getting into where you're positioning, you know, the back row front row kind of stuff, then I can see how there's much more meat to this and you don't need to be you know, micromanaging and telling each character what ability to do in each in each battle. And and like the cool thing is that they just have a skip skip the battle button. Where what? it's like you you go to it and they they will show you like the the matchup between them and it will tell you like this is approximately how much damage it will do. And then you can just press skip the button and and like the battle will play out just from that menu and you know like Weird. the characters are okay. much smaller it doesn't it doesn't go to the you know kind of it you know like um advanced wars combat kind of okay these are the attacks that are going back and forth you, you get and experience so, is that kind of like the yeah. uh, the incentive okay yeah I, I mean yeah like like the battles are still technically happening it's just like it sims it all you know without you having to watch watch the different attacks go back and forth because otherwise you go into a battle and you watch that and you can see they even, I think there's even a message that's like, Hey, if you don't know what's going on, like you should watch and see how your, 
basically how, how the way that you've programmed, how it's performing. Right. And you know, like all the different items, you're constantly getting new items. You're, you're picking up crafting materials from the overworld to craft, you know, better weapons and things like that, that also give different abilities and all these things. So there is, there is a ton of depth there. Um, and it's, and it's the first it's the first type of tactics game that I've played like this. So that has been interesting. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a different breed of tactics fan that I think it will get the most out of this. Yeah. And Kelsey going from like what the story emphasis on 13 Sentinels is what got you and now just being thrown into programming tactics like that's the learning curve. Yeah, well, it's funny. I feel like Vanillaware games are always doing one thing exceptionally well and everything else is just kind of regular good um and so yeah it's i think it's a total flip like the the story in this one is very whatever um the little side stories are a lot better as you kind of just meet new people and unlock new classes and um get these little vignettes of like i mean that this it's a very just generic like uh reclaiming the throne evil guy has taken over jrpg overarching story yeah um but you know you meet all these people and you see how these little vignettes of how each individual person is dealing with life under the rule of the evil person you know and and it's uh you you get a lot of like you, you get a lot of moral decisions of like should i spare this person or should i not but as far as i can tell and jeff and tell me if you've come up with anything else it seems like you should just always spare people because then they join your fight and if you don't they probably don't and then you just lose that character <laughs> yeah it it seemed I, I got to the the first one of those options and i i looked it up and people were like yes absolutely spare him because then he'll become a party member and i was like okay and and like if like they're giving you that choice for a reason right and if it feels like the choice the reason is always just going to be this person can be a part of your party if you do it. I don't know. If, I don't know if they're setting up some kind of betrayal that could possibly happen um, narratively if you if you let the right person go. But I saw in IGN's review that it's all about. There's a lot about marrying people, and that you can marry your cousin and a bunch of sick stuff like that. So you were looking for that specifically, and you I was came googling Google's which games review. can I marry That's my what cousin. Google search was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was like uh, Crusader Kings and Unicorn Overlord. So I had I could buy them both. I guess it's fine. Of course, of course. But is that a big thing too? Is just marrying different teammates? I I haven't had a marriage in my game yet. It's it's similar to like a um, again. This game draws for inspiration from a lot of different tactics games sure. and. Um, Fire Emblem is obviously one of the bigger ones. So, you know, you have people who fight together and then they gain uh, affection towards each other for fighting together. And then they get, you know, additional little dialogues and scenes and stuff because they've spent so much time fighting together. I haven't right. maxed anyone out, anyone's relationships out yet, though. So I assume that marriage happens at the max out stage. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine. Uh, so I'm trying to get a read for it. Jeff, um, you like it. Don't know if you'll stick with it. And Kelsey, where are you at on this overall love meter for this thing? Yeah, I, I mean, I am liking it. I'm liking it more the more I play it. It's it requires more thinking than uh, you know. I've played a lot of Fire Emblem. Fire Emblem, you kind of you kind of get your guys set up, and then honestly, if you get to a certain like level, you're fine. And the tactics are very, you know, it's it's like. I'm going to get this wrong, but it's like red beats blue and blue beats green or whatever. You know, it's right. very like simple words. This is like, well, you're going to want to have either an archer or like a, a witch or something in the back row of this one. While you're going to want to have a high defense guy in the front, but not if you're fighting this certain type of enemy. And it's just a lot to keep track of. Yeah. Um, and I am enjoying the process of getting closer to understanding it all but it is like it's more effort than i'm used to putting into a tactics game right um but i still yeah i think i'm gonna stick with it it's a pretty big map too like i really thought i i felt like i was walking all over the place and just recruiting all of these people and i was like man this feels like you know i i feel like i've done half the game and then you like zoom out and you're like oh <laughs> That's that's a lot. There's Jesus. a lot of map here. Uh, also, um, there's a lot of demo out there, too, because there's a free demo on all systems for this thing. Uh, and the demo is seven hours long and it carries over to the main game if you want to. But like it's one of those where if you're curious about Unicorn Overlord, you're out of excuses. Sure. You can jump in and try this thing. There's one very random small gripe I have with it. Yeah. Is that, um, the, the voice acting sounds like it was recorded in a tin can. I heard that in like a trailer. I was really confused. I'm also confused 
because uh, friend of the show, John Ricciardi over there from 8-4, uh, Sarah's alum, what do you say, alumnus? Kyle, how do I phrase Old that? Old boss. Old boss. Uh, they did the localization, so maybe they could actually say at some point if it was just like a weird COVID recording for some of these. Or maybe that's that's how they did recordings in the medieval medieval fantasy ages, Kelsey. Yeah, yeah. it was all, all wearing armor, that. right? So it's that's what it's they're a going for. Great point. That's yeah. a great point. The voice acting itself is good. It's just it, literally it sounds like it was recorded in a tin can. It's it's <laughs> baffling. That's confusing. But <laughs> Unicorn Overlord, the name of that game. Um, speaking of tactics, the best tactics you could ask for, which is just hitting X to hit that command menu, having it pop up and pause things, but things still move slowly in very slow motion as you're issuing commands. And of course, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, everybody. And look, we're not going to talk about it in a big way because we have the deepest dive going on. This next episode is covering chapters five through eight. So we won't bore everybody on the main show. every episode of the show? <laughs> I don't. I'm kind of tempted to. I'm a little bit obsessed with this game, Kelsey. It's kind of consumed my life. But I brought it up because you mentioned that you're going back to remake, right? Yep, I okay. am. I am finally. I'm inspired by Haley, who got through Yakuza <laughs> Seven in what, like a week and a half or something We're all like that, which by Haley. I yeah. do not understand. But um, and she said that was you a, know, it's, a, it's, a testament to you, um, and you owe her a favor now. So you repaying yeah. that favor is to play Final well, Fantasy Seven remake. It it feels like a blind spot to me. Like if we're it, obviously you're going to be going into the end of the year very hot on this game, and as as the resident JRPG person, I feel like I should probably have played it. Um, and I never, I really, I realized as I was playing it, I was like, I don't think I actually got that far in remake at all. I think I probably only got like nine hours in or oh, something okay. like that. So, are you a fan of the original, or is it just another I, RPG I, that you played back then? I'm a little too young to have uh, played it like for real when it was contemporary. Um, my oh. cousin was playing it and I watched my cousin play through a lot of it, but I really got kind of like, you know, I got this little vignette and this little vignette um, yep. all throughout it. So there's a lot of like holes I have it. And I did, I did, I went back and tried to play it at some point when I was like 20 or something and never finished it then. It was just either, too much so. fun. I get it. Like when you're at 20 years old, it's like, I can't handle how much fun I'm having with this game from 1997. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm in the exact same boat and I've tried to start that game like four times. <laughs> you guys are missing, <laughs> the out. Years. You're missing the, out. The, the, the furthest I got was on Vita. I had it on Vita and that got me out of Midgar, which I didn't even remember that I left That Midgar. is the most damning part of it, Kyle, is when we're playing Remake and you're on the deepest dive for that, you're like, yeah, yeah. I, I tried it a little bit. I made a couple hours in. I don't remember where I stopped. And then you went and booted up your save. Like, oh no, it turns out I got through all of Midgar. I just yeah, cared so totally little about it. I didn't remember <laughs> anything that happens in Remake. Like, oh my God. <laughs> for a game that I care so I about no, more than most things on Earth. I have no like warm fuzzies for my best friends that I, for, yep. you know, pranced through the 90s with or whatever, like you did. But, uh, probably Gallop. <laughs> but, you know, like, it's. It's clearly a good game. It clearly has good characters and stuff. So we'll we'll see we'll see how this develops. This is okay. <laughs> this, if you're not in love with remake, Kelsey, like I, we said it before, but Rebirth is remake in an open world. Like if you don't feel like you're compelled by the combat and remake or something, or the characters or the writing, I don't think Rebirth is going to win you over. Unless you're just oh no, really... I, no, I'm, I'm liking this a lot. Okay, but I haven't. Okay. I I have not. I've not yet passed where I was when I tried it the first time. Okay. Um. And it is still good. And okay. I'm still really liking it. But I'm like waiting to see what, you know, how this continues. You can ignore the side quests and stuff in Remake. I would, I would advise you I, if you're really enjoying you it really? in a big way. I mean, you're not going to be missing out on too much in Remake. Okay. Rebirth, I think, is another story, but we can talk about that in a bit. But where are you at in Remake right now? I am. Where am I? I got back from the mission with. Uh, Jesse and Biggs and Wedge, where you fight the the guy on the bike. Okay. Um, Roche. I got back. Roche. Yeah, Roche. 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 <laughs> I got back. I'm trying to think because I was I was playing on the plane um, day before yesterday. I can't yeah. remember how much further I got than that. I think it was. I think it was probably just right around there. Well, are you okay. playing on Steam Deck or something? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh, cool. That's that's such a good. Plays pretty play. well on Steam Deck actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was, I, I was, it up it hit one, one chug and I just had to like close it and reopen it and then it was fine. I am so curious to hear 
from you and Haley, if you are going to make it through Remake and then go right into Rebirth, I want to see. I am so curious to see what that's going to be like, but I do feel like, just because I love these games so much, I do feel like there's this weird extra pressure of, like, people feel like they're insulting me if they say that they're not blown away by these games. So I just want to set the template. You can think and say whatever the hell you want about these games, everybody. You don't have to <laughs> bend over backwards to be nice, yeah. Uh, by, by the way, way I... I went through this sequence in Rebirth the other night, Ben. Yeah. Where I did like four fights in a row. Right. And I was struggling with the fourth fight. And I said, you know, instead of retry battle, get, send me to the, back to the last checkpoint. The checkpoint and sent me back was three hours yep. before that <gasps> battle started. I was so mad. I was like borderline like, maybe I'm done with Rebirth. <laughs> so did you try? Because that is, it, I had that same situation and it was brutal. But did you try then just loading your autosave? Because that's what I had to do. And it brought me like right back to where I was. It, that was an option, but the thing was I wanted to go back a little bit to level up because I tried to do that thing where I was sure. like, because like uh, Janet was saying like, you know what? I've kind of stopped caring too much about the side quests, right? Yep. Yep. Maybe I can just mainline it. And I was like, me too. I'm going to try that. It's like, no, I need to, I need to go do all the stuff to level up because I'm getting stuck here. So, um, so I, yeah, it, it was, I'll, I'll tell in the future, I'll tell you what section it was and why it was particularly bad, okay. but it was, uh, it was frustrating, but I did get past it. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, we, um, we're doing the deepest dive. Yeah, covering chapters five through eight. We're collecting your comments on Thursday on Patreon. So right when this podcast goes up, uh, and then that will be up on YouTube and in the bonus podcast feed on Saturday, this Saturday for chapters five through eight for the deepest dive. Thanks everybody for submitting comments. We are getting a fair amount of comments, just so you guys know. They're saying, I just want to know what Jeff and Kyle think about this game. <laughs> and Jeff, um, you have been eerily silent about your time with Rebirth so um, far. <clears throat> well, I've streamed. I've streamed it twice now. Yeah, but um, you didn't say a word that entire got, time. I yeah, that is true. I just stone face. Um, <laughs> I I think I just got to Junon. Yeah, is that in? Is that a big? That's like the second big open area. And oh, that and region. As, okay, yeah. Yes, that region. And as soon as I got there, I was kind of like, I have to. I have to do all this open world stuff again. <laughs> and that's. And that that has that has been that has been it's kind of it has been solidifying in my mind of like, you know, my overarching feeling towards this one is that the game has become more westernized with open world elements yeah. for the worst. And and it's and it's those the open world things. It's it's not even that they're terrible or anything. I, I don't think there is there's there are. Honestly, some of them are just like so mediocre that you can't have strong feelings about them. But it's it's just I've done like they're all familiar. They're all so familiar is is the problem for me. And it's it's stuff that you do in in like every open world game or it's or it's like I'm scanning crystals. I when I go here, I'm going to do three button prompts and that will scan the crystal. Or, you know, I'm going to go to a tower and I don't actually have to climb the tower most of the time. I just have to probably fight fight a few enemies in front of it and then press a button on the tower. And it's like these things, they're not adding anything to the characters that I'm, I am really into and I'm enjoying. They're not giving me any story stuff. Like there's, there's some legitimate side quests that are good Those, and they do yes. add stuff. Yes. yes. But then there's the rinse but and repeat it, side quest for sure. Yes, it, it's it's like all the intel. It's it's all it's all that freaking Chadley is is what we came <laughs> for the conclusion. Uh -huh. It's all the jobs that he gives you. He has gamified exploring this world in a way that's super mundane and that I don't want to do and normally I would say, "Hey, you know what? Give fans all the extra content that they want. That's fine." But I feel incentivized to do it for exactly what Kyle's saying. I feel like I'm going to be too below level, which some of the some of the fights like there there are these weird random difficulty spikes with like just certain enemies sometimes that make me feel like okay, I got to get out, I got to upgrade my materia, I've got to I've got to do these extra things that that are just like again again they're not terrible, but it just feels like I'm killing time and I'm wasting time in a game where as soon as you get into a story, you know, mission or a big boss fight or whatever, like I'm so glued into it and I'm so enthusiastic about it. And then, and then I get to a new region and it's like, 
okay, I got to find chocobo stops and I've got to do like just all these little things that don't, oh, there's a bird that wants to take me to some place. <laughs> like none of that, none of that crap is doing anything for me. And it's not, it's not making the world any more interesting. And it, it just feels, it feels Western to me in a way that like, I've had my fill of open world games that have a million icons on the map that are just repeating the same little activities that don't mean anything. Yeah. And and so that like I'm still I'm still very much enjoying the game, but it is fun. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I realize I, I, sh- I, I probably exactly should have goes. led with that, but it but it <laughs> what is but going there on? but there is this th- it's just this because I enjoyed the like the combat's great all of, all of the other things that I love yes. about about remakes so much are great, but there's this chore work that is taking hours and hours to like fill up this little intel meter and like level me up a little. If you and, want, like, but I, that's the thing, though. I don't think that it is, is the if thing. you want because I've tried to avoid it and it's been a problem. <laughs> but you're bad at combat, bro. No, and it's I like could, I mean, and, I, will, I, I will take that. I will. Uh, I'll fully accept that. Yeah. And it's like I want to get the I want to get the materia that Chadley sells because some of them, you know. I haven't seen other places and like there there's stuff and like I I need to collect the resources to craft like I the crafting system, you know, completely fine. It's it's like every other sure. crafting system, but like I'm I'm using more items than than I did in remake or other games because I need I need some of those. I need like the phoenix drafts and you know the the health potions that that restore health to everybody and so like so they they have me using those things, but the downside of that is I have to go out and do more random fights against enemies in order to get the resources to craft sure. those things. If you all just... are driven insane by the open world stuff, I mean, Backstage Pass might have the, the shorthand of like, just mainline it, put it on easy, focus on the story stuff, blast through it. Like, you don't need I to... Guess, I guess that's... When, when I hear stuff like that, though, and I, again, I'm, you know, I'm still playing Remake, and I really like it, and everything I'm doing, even the side quests I've seen so far, like, aren't that annoying. Um, like, what, what, what is the point of not making this two games instead of three? You know, like, this... If, what I'm hearing from all of the people other than you, Ben, I guess, at least sure. on this podcast, is just like... There's so much freaking filler in this game. And yeah, you could put it on easy and breeze through it. But then, like, why was this not just all game number? You know, why was this not just yeah. all in one game? I think it's a really interesting it, question. And it gets back to, like, that they're kind of stuck doing it this way because the challenge is, okay, the big pitch for the content after Midgar is you get to explore the entire world, right? Classic old RPG style. So if you're remaking the original Final Fantasy VII, it's like, well, you have to have that moment of them emerging from Midgar and being like, whoa, there's a whole world beyond this tiny world that we've been focusing on. Now let's travel the world. And at that point then, if you're a designer, it's like, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to, like, you can't just make it too streamlined and pack in all that narrative content, or then it would be kind of like Final Fantasy X of like, okay, we can skip the open world, just kind of have you jump from town to town. But then again, it's like, okay, we have a huge world. Let's put some stuff in it. And look, they're not exactly CD Projekt Red, everybody. And like, I do think that the side quests that have storylines are compelling and good, and I've really enjoyed them in Rebirth. But yeah, there is some rinse and repeat stuff. It's not egregious in my mind, but... Yeah, the... The what do we fill the world with is, I th- I think the sticking point for me. It's like do what From Software did and fill your world with interesting things that are more one off or feel more unique or interesting or surprising instead of and and like like I said, I'm very much enjoying the game. the The disappointment that I have of it is thinking like, how much time did you spend on all of these systems? that you could have just made a little bit more unique content. Like, like, of you know, and for a game that has so many boss fights and so, you know, like, so much interesting content, it's like, it, it feels greedy to say that. But it's like, just focus on the parts that you're really good at and less of this procedural, you know, like, what feels like procedural kind of rinse and repeat things that every other open world game does have, but you yeah. don't need it because that's not what your strength is. And the the whole, like, I probably will switch it to easy and I will mainline more of it, but that that argument has the, it, it reminds me of, of, like, 
free to play games when it's like, well, you don't have to spend money because it, because it's, you know, it's all just aesthetics or whatever. So you don't have to do it. So, you know, that's not really a valid criticism. And it's like, you put this stuff in the game. You obviously want us to do it. You're incentivizing us to do it. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's, it shouldn't be on me to just like be okay with skipping the stuff that you put in there because, because it's not that interesting. Like, make more interesting stuff. And and I and I guess like you don't. I don't need to. I don't need to scan the same crystal fifty freaking times in order for you. <laughs> You've to convince done it me three times that so this far. Is, Let that the record show. Big, we what? Probably do do it by at about fifty by the Well, end sure. Game. He can complain once you get to that point. I've said you've only scanned yeah. like three <laughs> crystals and it's a little button press. That's no big deal. It no. You you scan each one three times, but I've done that like. 10 times there's crystals every everywhere it's like you're constantly <laughs> the finding summon crystals. crystal things the there are the ones that give you the resources then there are the other ones that i think you break that will help you defeat the right the summon right. maybe those are the ones that you're talking about yeah i think there were three of those but then there are the crystal archives that maybe the birds bring you to Right, right, right. Or the the chocobos bring you to the chocobo stations. The red birds bring you to those. It's just all crap. It's like <laughs> that's not interesting stuff, and it's not. It's not like like I would like I would love if something like added to the lore or just like meet a meet a meet an interesting person and don't tell me that if I go in and I read like. Chadley's little that's where the lore is like they archives. touch on like the history of the world but then if you want like it a sucks lore dude breakdown, that sucks that's the most <laughs> compelling stuff I could possibly imagine is like here's the history of these towns and this like formations of old governments before Shinra came along like all that stuff I understand I'm in the bag for this stuff can but, you like, can you put can you put that into something that doesn't make me have to press the triangle button three times while I look at a freaking crystal the, <laughs> what are those crystals doing Look, it's, I'm not trying to be full developer apologist, but I always think of like, well, this team, pretty early open world game. Not many people have worked on this. They clearly are inspired by Horizon Zero Dawn from 2017, so it's going to feel antiquated in a lot of open world design sensibilities and stuff like that. But I also think back to like, you know, having that take from Spider-Man 2 of so many people, I, I think it sounds absurd, um, but it's definitely out there of like the community being angry about how short it was, not enough side content. Uh, you could finish the main story and do everything in like 30 hours. Can't believe they charged 70 bucks for it. And like, not that they were rebounding off of that for rebirth, but clearly they have the message for the design of rebirth of like, we need to pack in a lot of optional content for people. And naturally it's going to suffer and it's going to have a bunch of repeatable crap in there. But it's not like this game a is... A lot of interesting content would have been the better note. Yeah, of course. That would have been nice. the word interesting in right. there when they wrote, <laughs> we need more content. Right. That would have fixed it. There, I do think, yeah. I mean, if you look at all of the quote unquote interesting content in Rebirth, squeeze it down. Good Lord, there's a heap and helping of it. You oh, know? yeah, like, absolutely. Okay. Like, like my, my complaint isn't that that stuff isn't there. It's that... I'm having to do these things in between the parts that I'm actually enjoying and want to sure. get to. And like when I got to that new, like I got to the new region, now I can't fast travel because I haven't caught the special chocobo and then I need to get chocobo stations or whatever. It's yeah. it's like, I, like that, is the, that is the cycle that I don't want to rinse. And I rinsed it once and that's okay, but I don't want to do the repeat. That's the game. However many more regions there are going to be in yeah. the future. I just want to get to the good stuff. Right. So maybe I will maybe I'll drop it to easy and maybe that stuff won't bother me as much. And my version of Jeffum's rant is I'm on chapter 13. Uh-huh. I think I prefer remake. Okay. Yep. That's, that's, that's fair. Version. I'm still, you know, on chapter 8, I'm going back and forth right now with which one I prefer. I think I'm leaning rebirth. I'm curious to see where it all goes and how it all wraps up and all that stuff. I will. It's it's a funny thing. It's very specific to me, but I also think I just liked being in the metropolis more, right? <laughs> like I liked being in the grungy, gross city. Yeah. Like, ultimately, because it's like once I'm outside, I'm like, oh, this is this is nice. But man, it looked really cool in that city. <laughs> yeah, they were a weird sci-fi world where everybody was yeah, miserable. Yeah, I, that's, maybe that's the Akira love in me. I love like that, just like a weird futuristic city. You yeah. Know? Um, were were people complaining that remake didn't have enough content? No, I think people complained about the lame uh, side quest stuff in remake. I think remake was a great size, but I think I th 
they could have trimmed this out. They could have trimmed it out. There's no doubt about it. I just think them going out of the way to yeah. try to pack more content in because like, well, it's an open world game. This is what Horizon does. I think that's the yeah. That's the and that I, I think that I think that is my issue. I I wish I wish they wouldn't have looked at other games or Western games and just come up with their own very weird take on on an open world, and it probably would have turned out more interesting. Yeah. For me personally. Yeah. Sure. Hey, uh, speaking of uh, weird sci-fi towns, how about Mars, everybody? Uh, this is a game Transition. called Mars After Midnight. Um, one of the funkiest games we'll talk about on this podcast, probably. But this is the new game from Lucas Pope, who made Papers, Please and Return of Ober Din. And it's only playable on the Playdate, which is, if you remember, mm -hmm. the little yellow cranky handheld thing that came out. God, was it early last year? When the hell was Playdate released? Oh my gosh! I think was it, it was last longer year? ago than that. I yeah, think it was like too. Yeah, two years. Uh, April. Count the layers of dust. <laughs> April of 2022. <laughs> out of my uh, it was kind of fun, Kyle. I don't know if you had the same experience. Of yeah, I had to charge it again, jumping back into the play date. It's like oh, now there's like the catalog. There's like a little store available, yeah. which wasn't there last time I played it. And it was really nice. They had like a best play date games of 2023 thing. So like, all right, let me just mop up on all these and grab all of them. And it kind of. Going back into Mars Wait, Did you buy a bunch or were they? There's like a press like, thing so you can just kind of like oh, click on it and down. I, it, I had to pay money for Mars After Midnight. You fool. How dare you support these developers? <sighs> Thank you. Um, but <laughs> my funny. takeaway from the play is going back to that ecosystem is like, this is just so refreshing. It's just such a lovely, weird thing. Um, and just seeing like just a bunch of small experiments from developers is the reason that I love the play date. And Mars After Midnight is kind of the perfect encapsulation of that. But what was your experience like going back to this thing, Kyle? I I, I want to love the play date <laughs> yeah, okay. so much. Like I love it conceptually. I love the hardware. I love how it feels. But the, the lack of a backlit screen yep. really makes it hard. And I really struggle to play the play date in general. Like I have to find light in the right angle. I was Googling around. I was hoping because it has like a USB-C port on the bottom. I was like, Did, can, is there like a worm light, like a Game Boy style worm light <laughs> that I can just stick in that USB-C port? Yeah. Um, and I saw, I found a Reddit thread of, of a lot of people recommending uh, book lights that they found that clip onto the play date really well, which, which is to say like, I really struggled to play the play date like genuinely, but I, I really... I love everything else about it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, it, I, I, it's funny. I had to update it like a thousand times. Same it did here. that thing where it was like update or great. And then I like come back a few minutes later. It's like, great. Now you have another update. I'm like, okay. And I did that like three times. It's, it's odd. And then I went yeah. and bought uh, Mars after midnight, which actually was kind of a charming experience because you have to actually crank to like buy. You have to like, it like a little meter fills to like make your $6 purchase or whatever, which was kind of fun. Yeah. But uh, I haven't played Mars After Midnight too much. I don't know about you, Ben. I just, I played for a couple minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I played it uh, a bit this morning. And Kelsey, number one played it, fan of the world. You haven't checked out Mars After Midnight quite yet? I haven't yet. No. I, yeah. I, I'm more than Kyle in that I actually do really like the play date. I'm not, I don't just want to like it, but I want to play it more. I yes. think it's my, yeah. Same. Yeah. yeah. And and that's I don't know I I just haven't gotten around to this yet but I would like to you should uh, yeah I mean go into that catalog store and just look at like twenty two three best of it's a great guy for like here's a bunch of just like arcadey games or like puzzle games weird word games it's just such a fun little thing and so seeing Mars after midnight and the fact that it's fifty five megabytes I'm talking Bellatro size game here Jeff I'm just everything you want um that's good. yeah so Lucas Pope's new game I mean my read is that this is kind of the it was seen as certainly they're not pitching it this way, but it's it felt like it was the killer app for the play date. Like, okay, a bunch of cool games. The most games notable launch. one. I think I guess, so. I guess there's a Takahashi game. The Kita Takahashi. Right? Yeah, after, but that one was a launch title, the right. um, Kita Takahashi one. Yeah, and now it's, it's been the, like. The Katamari creator for anyone. Yeah. Nowhere. And now it's been like two years of like, oh, Lucas Pope is making a game. When's that coming out? When's that coming out? And it's finally out. Um, and the, the premise is you are a. You're working on Mars as a... What's the word I'm looking for, Kyle? You, like, manage support groups or something? Is that what you <laughs> yeah, do? Yeah, but specifically... Oh, bouncer, right? A bouncer at the I, door, well, yeah, but I then guess, also right? managing different support groups on Mars to try and take care and support the population of freaky monsters on Mars, I guess is the yeah. overall idea. So you're using the crank to, like, open the slit on the door and, like, 
shove your eyes there to look at what monsters or aliens are trying to get into the support group and then closing it back up if they're not yeah. meeting the criteria. And so it's yeah, a, the opening the opening criteria was it, it gives you like symbols and it's it's sad Cyclops. Yes, right? it was a Cyclops you anger management. You can't let in people class. with more than one eye, and you can't let in Cyclops who are smiling. So you have to like, all right, how many eyes you got? And then you're like, all right, what's your mouth look like? Are you frowning or are you happy? Which was very charming and silly. Like I like you kind of like, you know, look around. You have to sort of angle yourself through the hole that you opened up to like see. It's like, all right, should I let you in here? Or yeah, let, let me see that mouth. OK, this mouth is smiling. <laughs> this Cyclops does not mouth? have anger management issues. No good. But it's really funny because it's like you're opening up with a little crank, looking at a freaky alien surveying to see what his face is like and then frequently just like slamming it back shut in their face <laughs> and so you can yeah. hear them go like oh outside as then they walk away it's a what then are they frowning at that point so can you oh me? interesting if they're they that angry about it they would come back so after you finish that first one kyle then it's like a weird world map where you're setting up flyers for different support groups on mars and they each have like different themed for the support groups, which is just determining like the criteria for who you let in. So they have, they're just absurd. Like the next one I did was the shy smiler mixer where you can only let people <laughs> in who aren't smiling. Uh, so you have to like study their mouth to see if they're going to do it. Uh, there was windproof warriors where they get blown away. There was non blinker round table support group. So if they don't <laughs> blink, then you can That's let so them into your establishment. And then my favorite was one called flinchers only. So you'd have to, you'd actually got like an air horn and you'd open up this little slot <laughs> and then shoot that, an yeah. air horn in their face. And if they flinch, it's like, all right, come on in, buddy. You're good to go. Uh, and so there's that. But then there's also like the management of the actual support group food inside where you're choosing which food to feed them and then like arranging the table and cleaning it up and all this uh, and you have silly tentacles stuff. and you can lift multiple plates and right stuff. Yeah. right this game isn't gonna blow you away i don't think it's like go spend 200 dollars on uh, the plate dead immediately but it is a fun silly little game and little lucas pope said yeah. that they wanted to create it for their kids and stuff which i think is a perfect way to frame what's going on with this simplistic weird thing i mean i i think there's an ending Right. Yeah, like I, I, could, so. I could play it and beat it. Right. Which is what mm -hmm. I'd like to do, because I, I did the first, you know, full cycle with with the Cyclops. And I was like, yeah, I want to keep going. I, I, I want to see this to the end because I can't imagine it's particularly long. Right. It's just like a charming little indie thing. I would think so. I'd like to beat some play date game other than Pick Pack Pop, which is still the, the greatest game on the system in my mind, my very limited yeah. mind. But, but if, I mean, play date, if you if I can like send you this and you can like integrate a backlight, I will pay for that. Like I just <laughs> need it to be backlit and that will solve like all my problems. Just play outside, man. Uh, so Lorch Durden watching us live at the backstage past here, they say faces, please. That is yes, <laughs> that is a barbaring lead. Yeah. This does feel like a weird sci-fi simplistic version of papers please i guess in a lot of ways but it's paper papers please meets sesame street i guess is the pitch for what mars after midnight <laughs> is good. uh but it is sweet um yeah it just uh, by the way I should point out the music is freaking awesome uh it's lucas blows doing the soundtrack which if you remember the soundtrack to ober den it's freaking awesome and so the music in this game it kind of sounds like it's all chip tunes. It kind of sounds like the VVV VVV soundtrack. You remember how good that soundtrack was? Different creator and composer, mm -hmm. obviously. But it just it has me excited for, you know, quote unquote legendary developers, indie developers, just making small little side projects. You know, like I, I would love to see a game of this scale from like a Miyamoto or from a Neil Druckmann going into the AAA space. Like I just want to see big name developers just taking time to make something weird and small. Yeah. And I'm so glad that played like, it like is a big director making a short film. Yeah. Or something, right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's super fun to see. Um, cause Kelsey, I was trying to think like, what is the last, I know we can't just go to the top of the heap, but it's more fun. But like, I'm trying to think of the last small Miyamoto projects that got out there. Pac-Man versus. Hey, did he work on that? He made some Pac-Man maps for that GameCube Pac-Man game, yeah. Okay, that's perfect. I was thinking of like... Yeah, I don't know what the last time he like... You know, he's been just kind of like a, a director, supervisor. Like, he's, it seems like he's been doing a lot more of the like overseeing in a lot of these projects rather than like, I'm going to craft this level or whatever myself. So... Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, a, know, I don't oh, know the answer to that one. I was thinking the Wii Mario U. Run, I think he said he made some. Oh, oh that's, that's right. interesting. Tezuka, yeah. yeah, did work on that with him. But I was thinking of like the launch of the Wii U. There are those tech demos. It was like Project Giant Robot. And I was trying to look back at the wording for how they were pitching that. They were saying there were Miyamoto-focused projects and that was also Star Fox Guard. Was that, was that true of... Um, 
Labo? Nintendo Labo? I don't think Miyamoto's involved with Labo directly. I would like to I thought the giant that, robot thing was like an ex- like that oh, was an extension or Labo that's was like right. an extension of that. But I, I could be wrong. I, no, I think they did so. use some of that tech because there was that big robot game in Labo. That is kind of the ultimate yeah. home of Project Giant Robot. I forgot but about that. There was with Star Fox Zero came included with like a Star a Fox game. Guard. Okay, right. And that wasn't that not that wasn't born of that robot game? I thought no, that, that was, was separate. So the Wii U tech demos for okay, the E3 okay. before the Wii U launched, it was a Project yeah. Giant Robot and then the Project Guard. And the Project Guard thing they turned into Star Fox. And yeah, I forgot that they turned the other one into the weird what, Labo what game. What if Miyamoto was like, I actually designed the 57th shrine in Tears of the Kingdom. Like, Wh- I did why not? that one. <laughs> why not? And like, just remix his name and call it that? Yeah. yeah. Come on, get off your butt. Quit designing theme parks and movies. Come on, dude. What are you doing, man? Uh, did you have thoughts on that new mo- uh, Mario movie announcement, Kyle? Uh, yeah, it's good. I'll be there. Sure. Okay. Do you have any I thoughts? I don't know. I, that movie, the more I reflect on it, and the more I watched it a couple times since, like have it on, throw it on, I'm like more and more underwhelmed by it <laughs> like yeah. as time goes on. Um, I'm What's um the the new Rise of the the Planet Planet of the Apes movie? Yeah. Kingdom like, of the Planet I haven't Apes. been keeping up with that series at all, but I'm tempted to like I want to go see that movie in theaters. Maybe this is a video you and I can do, Ben, but like what watching that movie, what can we extrapolate from that movie for what the Zelda movie will be, you know? <laughs> because it's the same director as the upcoming same Zelda director, movie. Yeah. 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 I mean, we talked about it, but yeah, going back to that guy's early short films, it is kind of like weird sci-fi Zelda. Really? It kind of looks like Planet of the Apes stuff. It's kind of fun to see. I watched Maze Runner because I read that book and I liked the book okay. Um, and the, movie, the movie really falls apart after like the first 45 minutes. Isn't it? I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that's the fault of the director though. I think that's just a weird story. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I'd be up for doing that. I guess, I mean, I'm going to see the new Planet of the Apes anyway. I love those freaking movies. So. Do you think I can see that without seeing any of the other ones? You haven't seen the, what? Oh my God, Kyle. I saw the very, very first one. Wait, the Charlton Heston one, 1968? No, no, no. Well, I've seen that one, but I'm talking about the, the recent reboot. With, right. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, Kyle, you need With to. Draco Malfoy? Yeah. Don I'm of the trying pl- to remember who else was in that movie. <laughs> no, I think he was the starring role. He played all of the apes as well. That's um, right. okay. That movie, but, I, I, mean, I, I love. Just don't, I just want to watch the Zelda director one. Do I need to watch all the other ones? Dude, okay, Kyle, okay, honestly, <laughs> that movie. If I you don't good. watch 12 Planet of the Apes movies before you see that one, Kyle. Don, You're not going to get the context. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Kyle, I will go to the mat. You will love that movie. Okay, Ra- I, I don't doubt it. I'm not like some anti Planet of the Apes guy. That's the the Batman director, right? Yeah, yeah, right, C- yeah. Come I on, like man! I guarantee you'll love that. And like the Rise of the Planet of the Apes, I love that movie. It is hokey. It's over the top at times. Uh, that Draco Malfoy completely ruins it. It's a madhouse, that entire scene. But still, like, I, I love that movie a lot. It's just so fun yeah, to have that, that sense movie. of momentum. Yeah. And then Dawn just shifts it completely. And it's just like somber, cool, quiet sci-fi movie. It is awesome, right. Kyle. You will love Dawn of the Planet Names. And War is kind oh. of that again, and it's all right. But Dawn is freaking awesome. Are there any jokes? Because uh, if in, there are jokes, I can get my daughter to watch them with me. If there are no jokes, she's not interested. This is a question. You can't get her to go see Dune with me. Not interested. Doesn't look funny. There's no jokes in Dune? <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. No, I think there's like one joke in the first Dune. I still haven't seen the sequel yet. Oh, my God. Actually, Dune Part 2 is is funny. Javier Bardem, it, like he was making the okay. theater laugh a lot. He was funny in the first one. Okay. Well, Spin he's going to slay the scene. entire crowd. That's like I can make a whole stand up about that. <laughs> if your daughter loves Messiah jokes. She That's is enough be... humor for your for your for your daughter, Kyle. Spitting on the like floor, the one yeah, joke actually. in that movie was like, okay, check, we'll keep watching. <laughs> no, I, I it stems from me trying to convince her, like, hey, do you want to go see this crazy sci-fi movie? And I think I showed her some. I shouldn't even make it through the trailer. She's like, this doesn't look funny. I don't, I don't care. It's <laughs> like, it's right. not the funniest thing I've ever seen. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> wait, Dune Two, not the funniest movie. <laughs> it's not the funniest. Seen. It is funnier than the okay. first one, but no, I think like if I was at the pearly gates, Kyle, the first question I'd have for uh, the good Lord upstairs. That ask him, are there any jokes in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes? Because I'm not comfortable saying yes, there are. This will dictate whether you get in or not. (laughs) Everything I remember from that movie is cool and quiet, but not exactly a joke. Well, there, there's the, there's the part where um, Caesar scratches his butt and then smells his finger and then tips over. Right. Does that part God, count? I yeah. always forget about But that was at like the post credit scene. So sometimes I don't count <laughs> <Yeah>. those, <laughs> I think. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, Kelsey, 
who needs hey Kelsey, who needs the Planet of the Apes when you can have the Planet of the Llamas? Am I right? That's right. Hey, hey, Kelsey Lewin. Hey, Kelsey Lewin. Who needs unicorns and overlords when you have llamas? Am I right? And camels <laughs> and uh, sheep. Uh huh. And psychedelic. Uh, was it metagalactic camels? Um, yeah, at the edge of time. Right. Right. Jeff, let's talk about Star Wars Dark Forces. No, um, no, this is setting up the game Lava Soft, <laughs> the Jeff Minter story, which is uh, let's set our calendar and just have a discussion like this every eight months on the podcast. This is the new game from Digital Eclipse. Um, it is in their Gold Master series. So this is their documentary games. We've talked about it before with Atari 50 and then with the making of, of course, Kelsey knows how to pronounce it. Kara, what? Oh, Karateka. There we go. Thank you. Um, and so this is their new release, and it's called Llama Soft, the Jeff Minter story, which, believe it or not, freaking rules. <laughs> and I want everyone to support it because it's so cool that these documentaries exist. Uh, interactive documentaries, I guess the best way to put it, where it seems like the other ones where you're running through the history of I love this so much more. Basically, Jeff Minter, this British game developer, his entire development history. Um, and you're getting a bunch of old documents, clips of videos, and then also you can play all of these different games that he played, different versions of these different games in kind of this interactive timeline is the easiest pitch for this thing. Um, I was so excited to jump into this because Jeff Minter, I always just heard him referenced on the Giant Bombcast back in the day, like, uh, you know, Jeff Gersman and Brad Shoemaker in particular were always really passionate about like, yeah, just... I think the coolest developer out there is Jeff Minter. He's just making psychedelic technicolor weird stuff on his own. He's been doing this for so long. And so I played Tempest 2000 and 3000 and 4000. And I really like Tempest. But outside of that, I didn't have a frame of reference for what Jeff Minter had really worked on. Um, and it's it's been really fun to have a game like this now just dive into a specific scene of like, you know, early 80s game development in England. And it's a lot of, ZX talk and a lot of just systems that I'm not too familiar with Commodore pet and a bunch of weird stuff like that. And so I love just zooming in on these little pockets of history, but what do you think about llama soft so far, Kelsey? I'm loving it. I, you know, Jeff Minter was not a developer that I could have given you like a, a intricate history of before this. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, like this has been actually incredibly educational too. Um, and it's just, it's so funny because I'm realizing, I'm like, man, like, if I were British in the 80s, I would have been in love with this guy. Yeah. Like, I, this would have been so my jam, and I would have been saying the same thing. I would have been like, oh my god, no one's doing it like Jeff Minter. Like, this is, this is so wild, and, you know, everything else is boring. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, you know, I, I think it, it starts off maybe with a little too lengthy of an introduction with just 10 different people saying like Jeff Minter, he's real weird. He's real different. And like how many different ways can you say this man is different before you start the freaking game? But, but I, but I think um, just to cut you off there, like I do like that intro because it kind of set the template of like, Oh, all the people that got to talk about him is like British games press. And so I love yeah. even the specificity of that. of like, okay, this is just an avenue that I certainly need more of an education in. So even though it was a little bit redundant, it's like, all right, it's setting it up and it's setting up the tone for like, this guy had an impact on a lot of people in the games press scene. Well, when you get to a point where, you know, somewhere in the, in the documentary, you have one of these, one of these British press guys who's been talking about how, you know, he's interesting and he's cool and all of that. And then you find out like they had beef for a little while because he like dragged one of his games in, in the British magazines. And like, it just kind of gives you, I, I like that it gave you that context a little bit later um, to color it. But yeah, I mean, he's got, he's got some really interesting stuff. I mean, uh, I don't, do you, Ben, do you play through all of the games yeah. when you're going through it? Okay. Um, Hover Buffer is incredible. <laughs> the, the weird I, lawnmower game thing. I am a I'm a big fan of Hover Buffer. Now, which, <laughs> yeah, it's a a game about stealing your neighbor's lawnmower and avoiding them trying to steal it back from you and a dog. And you know you're just trying to like mow your lawn, but there's a bunch of flowers and obstacles and stuff in the way. And when your neighbor like is like, give me that back, give me my lawnmower back, then you're just like, I'll just go over to Todd's house and I'll take his lawnmower now. And it's just, <laughs> it's just the, it's just the dumbest, funniest game. But, um, but then combine you know, it. I, I googled it. I looked. The box says it has the title in it. it. Says you've never played a game like this before. It's like, yeah, 
That's a lot that of these right. games. That sounds right in 2024. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's like that weird stuff, but then right next to stuff like Grid Runner, which seemed like it was his first big hit, and that's more like reflex, twitch-heavy, arcade action, psychedelic awesomeness. And I think the turning point for this, it, it's just so cool. It's so cool to be able to play all these games back-to-back and... Look, everybody, you're going to play these games for a minute and you'll be like, okay, I got it. Some of these oh, old yeah. PC games, like, okay, this is just cool to see what this is like. But you have that in context and working through somebody's entire career by playing every draft of every game they've ever made. You don't get to do that really anywhere else in the game industry. It's such a good way to like absorb the journey of this person's entire career, even if it's just interactive glimpses at everything they're putting out here. But I think what really uh, was a turning point for me was when he got to psychedelia which is the game he made for the atari that's like it's not really even a game it's just kind of a visual synthesizer where you can choose different songs to play and then you can kind of interact with it in a different way um but i love the fun mirroring of them talking about that project it's like well it's not really a game the press at the time didn't know how to treat it and then zooming out and be like oh that's how people treat these gold master series from digital eclipse is ah, should it go in the 210s I don't, it's not really a game i don't know what to do with it but i loved having this just weird perspective on him being like you know some of the reviews came in for that psychedelia thing and people are saying that like they can't even begin to describe how amazing it is it's life-changing and he's like those are some of the best reviews i ever got and then also reviews are coming in saying it's not a game it's trash don't buy this thing in any way and so just seeing like the impact of him getting freakier and freakier as he went along. And then also the part that got me is just like having a sense from this of I'm such a sucker for the influence of the regions these games were developed in having an impact on the games themselves. And the Jeff Minter story is such a great example of that, of like early on you see his sketches of learning. He's like teaching himself how to learn, uh, how to program in basic alongside a bunch of just like psychedelic pink floyd fan art that he drew in his diaries and like leading from that to his psychedelic world through game development it's like oh this is such a cool time and place to zoom in on and then let me keep rambling um it's also just fascinating on the time and place thing because the company's called llama soft he's obsessed with llamas and it does feel like such just a weird wacky british thing i don't know if it's a Monty Python influencer, what? Like, isn't it random just to have llamas be everywhere in all of our games? And it carries through even today with like, um, with the Lego games over there developed in England, how they always like shoehorn a sheep as an Easter egg and the carrots as Easter eggs. And it feels just like, oh, that is such a quirky British thing that even in the very early 80s was in place in the game development scene. And I think it's really fascinating too with him talking about um, starting uh, Llama Soft back in the early 80s, and that also lines up with uh, the Falklands War, which I'm not a huge expert on, but bear with me, Kyle. But the idea was, if you remember, Argentina and England were warring over these islands uh, in the Atlantic, right? Um, and so that had me thinking too about like, okay, is there some llama connection there because of South America and Argentina? And so he said he got the obsession with llamas because his parents had like a book on uh, South America and there was a cool llama drawing in there that he was obsessed with. But it's like, it is weird that he made several games that were kind of satirical games about the Falklands War with Argentina, but then he became obsessed with like a South American animal that defined his entire career at the same time. There's just, there's a lot of cool stuff mixing and swirling in the pot for a developer like Jeff Minter. That's, this game does a great job of, of highlighting. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the, the psychedelia thing in particular was just, it's very interesting to see when different parts of the game industry start to discover this idea of a not a game game and right. like i feel like it's it's lots of starts and stops kind of throughout video game history no matter what like region or you know whether it's pc or console or whatever um but you know like 1984 is pretty early for that i mean atari had a kind of similar thing with atari video music right. um, which is in the late 70s but it was you know like it was like parallel evolution in that case because he had you know, at least according to him, he had never heard of it. He found out about it later. Um, you get like little computer people in like 1985 and stuff. And it's just every time something like this happens, you have people who are like, what? And it's, I don't know, it's not until like The Sims, I feel like, that people finally start to be like, okay, maybe not all games need to be like 
normal games, but I love seeing these little like these pieces of it everywhere. Um, and in, I mean, shoot in Japan too, like the um, creator of Electroplankton and stuff. I mean, he he goes way back with some weird like music and video uh, kind of programs and stuff. Yeah, that just are not real games. And, and I think of like, um, um, I don't know, I'm kind of rambling, no, but like no, I, just, I, I love seeing where that starts in all these different places and, and who discovers it. Uh, but I, like, I would love to talk on to like, their own. Yeah. I would love to talk to like Dylan Cuthbert. Do you remember like pixel junk 4am when that came out, like on PS3, I think it's like, okay, I'd imagine Dylan Cuthbert over there, a programmer for Star Fox. He probably is a Jeff Minter fan. Is there some oh, yeah. connection and through line just for the overall impact of this guy? But I think what's fascinating about this and focusing on his life is just highlighting the overall idea of he's been developing games for 40 years. He's had hits, but he's never exploded to the mainstream in a big way. And it it's just, it's a nice story of like, hey, he has found his sweet spot for game development. They call it a peaceful compromise. And he like has a nice house out in the country where he raises llamas and a bunch of other beasties and he put, as he puts it. It shows him just like feeding his burrows and whatnot out there in the fields of England. And this guy has just been making weird psychedelic games for 40 years now. And it's an awesome spot in the game industry. I, it, I feel like I get Jeff Minter now because of this, which I guess is, it'd be a problem if I didn't after playing the interactive documentary all about him, but it, it's just such a great perspective to have. Yeah. I mean, I, I have obviously have a much bigger uh, appreciation for him now after, after playing through a bunch of this and, um, oh, just another little tiny thing. Just again, these, these kind of flashes of innovation that don't necessarily have like an evolutionary through line, like in 1985, he puts out a compilation of his old games called Yak's Progress. Like, we weren't doing game compilations right. from, like, single developer things back then. That wasn't a thing. Like, that's a thing we do now. Um, but I don't know, just those kind of things where it's like, ah, yeah, the little little glimpse of the future in this weird developer um, that, I don't know, I've, I've got a much greater appreciation for it. And, and I... I hope that these ones that have, I, I think Jeff Minter is a lot more well known in, in, you know, in the UK and stuff. So maybe this isn't like a surprising title as much over there. Right. But for here, I think there's probably a lot of Americans who are like, who? What? Yeah, but he makes he makes camel games. Like, <laughs> I would love to see more developers that are maybe a little bit lesser known or a little less mainstream. Um, and I just I don't know. I hope this does well enough to keep continuing to fund that. Like they don't all need to be. Uh, I mean, I would I would love a Miyamoto one, obviously, but they don't all need to be like someone that everybody's heard of. Yeah. Kyle, the camel thing came about. He made a game called Revenge of the Mutant Camels. Um, right. And, yeah. And the idea was that he was reading a review about the old game based on Empire Strikes Back. And they were talking about AT-ATs. And the review said, there's these big robotic camels you have to take down. It's like, well, that's a better game. <laughs> and so then he just made a game <laughs> based on that. Um, and yeah, then was, he made another game where you get to play as the camels because, and on the title screen, it's like, I actually like camels, really. So this time you get to be <laughs> the camels and take down everyone instead of vice versa. I was trying to think. I'm almost certain I played a, a, a mentor game on PSP. Does that sound probably? Familiar? Yeah. Okay. So the thing that's kind of disappointing about this is it seems like it really cuts off around like 2000. It's like Tempest 2000, I think the last thing in the timeline for playable games because he released so many games after that and it's kind of a bummer that more aren't included unless I'm missing something here and I haven't fully finished the the story uh, and so maybe it'll unlock a bunch more but I doubt it but I assume it's just it gets into weird right stuff after that but he's still been making a bunch of freaky stuff Kyle yeah I think I'm looking at this game TXK and I'm like did I review this oh <laughs> I think interesting I reviewed it. yeah <laughs> But anyway, yeah, it's uh, how long how long is the whole like, you know, quote unquote game? Is it like I heard whatever, like less than five hours to get. The oh, whole thing yeah. Like that? Two, okay. two and a half. Yeah. OK. Um, which, you know, we talked about it last time with uh, the making of Karatika uh, of it's like it's it's awesome. Could not be more happy with this projects. I think 30 bucks is a little bit steep, but I want to support them in any way that I can. And sure. so, you know, find your right level for that. But I think yeah. it's. I mean, you get, you I get, I get a lot fact, of video games TXK. in there. There are a lot of video games that you'll never want to play again. Uh, Kelsey, <laughs> except for yep. Tempest 2000. Yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, Llama Soft, the Jeff Minter story is the name of that thing. You should you should check it out. I really love it and I think it rules. Um, speaking of loving and thinking that they rule, um, we should talk a little bit about Akira Toriyama passing away. Uh, that was right after we released the podcast last week, the creator of Dragon Ball and obviously the the artist for Colonel Trigger, Blue Dragon, Dragon Quest, <laughs> Jesus Christ, most importantly, maybe. A um, bunch of other stuff. Uh, passed away, I think at age 68. Um, Kyle? Yeah, he was young. I guess so. Um, it, this is one of those, you know, I, it's always surprising when a celebrity death really hits you hard. And this is one of those where I saw the headline and was like, oh, geez, that's crazy. And then just the rest of that night, I just kept thinking about like, God damn. Like, it's such a, it really got me that idea of like, oh, I guess just Dragon Ball is done forever. You know, they'll probably continue some storylines here and there. Uh, there was obviously that new series that Toriyama was working on where Goku right. and now Vegeta yeah. and, and Bulma are kids um, with Dragon Ball Daima that's going to be releasing this year. So I'm curious to see how that goes. But it's just like, you think about the impact of this artist that he had on so much culture around the world and specifically the game industry. And it's like everything just keeps piling up and snowballing to like, Jesus Christ, the impact of this one dude is mind boggling. And it really, really got me in the gut with this guy passing away. Yeah, no, I felt similar where I was, he just felt like one of those forces that was just always going to be around, you know, like maybe he wouldn't be actively involved in all the projects, but he would always, you know, pop up to draw a new character. Like, I just thought that would be forever. Right. You know, and it's one of those moments where I was like, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe this happened. It really, yeah, it was, it, 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 it hurt. Yeah. And, and I think it's a weird thing because I've tried reading all the interviews I can find about his work on the game industry. And there's, he doesn't do that many interviews in general. Like, I think I could have walked by this dude on the sidewalk and not even noticed it, but just in terms of like cultural impact and for He's how much unassuming. I love Dragon Ball. Yeah. And yeah. He, he also seemed to have that same approach to his work, even where it like, I remember reading some quote from him when he was working on the Broly, the Dragon Ball Broly movie. Right. And he was like, I don't even remember how to draw Broly. Like, and it was like, <laughs> this is like one of the most iconic, like Dragon Ball characters ever. Like you, I mean, I guess I'm, I don't I'm trust Broly fans, it. but yeah, I hear you. But it's just like you, you forgot this character that you forgot you drew is like so important, <laughs> you know? And that's like, you've drawn like a billion characters and so many of them have become just like, crazy iconic like even just thinking about um like the slime from dragon quest which is just like the simplest thing that has become like synonymous with dragon quest obviously but then also like rpgs and by an extension like video games in general like you can see that little weird blob and you just know exactly what it is and where it's from and what it represents and it's 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 crazy yeah he does have that full kind of unassuming and i'm sure he's a nightmare to work with and license and all that fun stuff but uh just reading like <laughs> interviews um with him about dragon quest like he did an interview briefly about dragon quest 11 and they talk about like the origins of him working on the dragon quest series and all that stuff and he says really if i had known that it would still be going on after 30 years i don't think i would have taken the job <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if I had known how long it would last, I would have politely declined. I'm not good at doing the same thing over and over again, which is funny because I think from the outside, people look at like, well, Dragon Ball, it just seems like you guys are just doing the same fights and finding new forms of being a Super Saiyan over and over and over again. Well, I saw I saw some quote from him recently that because there's like so many things are just popping up about Toriyama uh, now. And he was talking about because like it's spoiler alert for Dragon Ball, the twist like, you know, in Z is that Goku is actually an alien from another planet. And it was interesting to hear him just sort of comment on that and be like, oh yeah, that was like never a plan for me. I just sort of came up with that at one point and I was very much like, yeah, we'll see how this goes. I don't know where, I don't know where it's going, but sure, let's make Goku an alien. <laughs> it's like, Whoa, now it's okay. the defining thing. But I think that kind of looseness, I think it, it helps. And it's so easy for this to be a shorthand and not actually what's going on behind the scenes. But from the outside, it was like, you know, Dragon Ball GT was continuing from Z and it is not great. Sorry fans. Um, but then it was such big news when like, Hey, Toriyama is coming back. They are going to make Dragon Ball super movies, right? This is before it was a series. Like we're making what attack of the Saiyans. Is that the DS game or is that the first movie? I always get those two confused. It's, uh, it's a f battle of gods. Thank you. Thank movie. you. Yeah. Um, and that right, movie Jeffen? is that Jeff. Do you recall? Jeff, is that right? Is it Battle of Gods? Battle of Gods? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, but I really think 
the super series I I enjoyed a fair amount, but the super movies I consider that like as good as it gets for quote unquote lega sequel content like continuing an old storyline with the pitch perfect tone like those movies destroy me and a lot of it's coming from like how lighthearted and funny they are they know exactly what they are they know exactly what their audience is they're going to give you some awesome fights but especially that first movie it just feels like it's 70 percent a comedy you know with vegeta oh, yeah. trying not to piss off beerus and again maybe i'm in the bag for it but i just feel like the tone is perfect in a way that I haven't felt since like remake and rebirth. Like those two are like up there in my mind for like, you understand this so well. And I would certainly hope after spending a lifetime with it, but it's so refreshing to have the original creator come back for those movies and just be like, Oh no, here's what this is. It's a lighthearted show. Everyone stop taking Dragon Ball so seriously, please. And they just knock it out of the damn park. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Kelsey, do you have thoughts on Toriyama? Are you a fan of Dragon Ball? Yeah. I mean, I, Yes, I watched a lot of Dragon Ball Z and stuff as a as a kid. I wouldn't say I'm someone who like carried that with me into adulthood or kept up with it really, but um yeah, I mean obviously just an enormous impact on not just manga, animation, comics, culture, but of course also gaming. I mean, you know, Dragon Quest was like the first time you had really complex uh I mean, I say really complex, obviously. It's not uh <laughs> Nothing like today, but like it, that was a game that looked like a PC game that you needed a much more expensive machine for yeah. on a Famicom. And it was like, you know, D&D concepts that were for nerds, but that had been given like real life to them by Toriyama that hadn't that just really hadn't been done before. I mean, just really made these characters look um, relatable and interesting and, you know, with his cartoon style as opposed to. It, the very just like airbrushed hyper realistic stuff that everyone had gotten from RPG, whether it was you know tabletop or um, you know Ultima Wizardry, whatever, up until that point. And I think that really, like that was a that was a very big turning point for uh, the game industry. Yeah, and and then maybe the biggest impact for a lot of uh, super fans is Chrono Trigger. Obviously, is a, is a biggie, right? And so. It's funny to look at the history of Chrono Trigger's development because it's like, oh, it's this big merging of the minds of the greatest RPG developers of all time of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest and Akira Toriyama doing the art. But it seems like he wasn't really that involved in like the story or anything with Chrono Trigger. And like we found uh, an interview here where he talks about or the developers of Chrono Trigger were talking about like, yeah, it was actually kind of hard because he was there like the earliest phase of planning this stuff out and he would draw the characters, but then he'd only draw them from the front and so we didn't know what all these characters would look like from any other angle. And it was a real challenge for the team. And then they also talked about like Lavos, like the final boss in Chrono Trigger. What a pain in the butt that was because he didn't draw a concept for it. And so they had to like come up with a concept. Like, Is this something Toriyama would draw? I don't know. Let's just plug it in. But I think it's kind of cool to have Lavos stand out in that way for for being different overall. But um, do, do we know if he was like a big, did he play video games? Like, no. I don't, I don't even know. Doesn't no, seem okay. like it from interviews. Yeah. yeah um, all right. I'm so curious, though, what this means for the future of the games that he's still tangentially related to. Like, there's been rumblings that maybe Square will make a remake of Chrono Trigger. I would love for it just to be in the HD 2D style. I feel like that's the best case scenario. But there is, um, I think we talked about it last week a little bit, but on Simon Parkin's podcast, uh, My Perfect Console, um, Katase, the director of Chrono Trigger, co-director, I suppose, specifically, uh, was on that podcast. And it wasn't brought up naturally. Like he went out of his way to be like, Hey, if there was a remake of Chrono Trigger, what would you want it to look like? And so it's one of those <laughs> things of like, did he just lose an argument in the office? And now he's trying to get some outside pr perspective on it. Or like, are they just at the earliest planning phase now of what that could look like? But I feel like people are going to be hungry for Toriyama stuff. And if they just keep his art intact and do like an HD 2d version of Chrono Trigger, Good Lord, that, that could that's be That's what huge. I want. I mean, yeah. full honesty. Yeah, is like just, that's what I, because that art works so well, even in 16 bits still to this day. Uh, I don't think it really needs to be smoothed out or, or improved, but maybe that's just the nostalgia in me. I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe if they made like a proper, it looked like a, a Toriyama anime, right? If that's what the Chrono Trigger remake would look like, maybe I would eat my words and be like, my God, this looks incredible. Yeah. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. What? 
the estate will carry forward with. Like, it's just going to be bizarre because there's also Sandland, which is the game that's coming out this year from Namco. Yeah, that, Namco. One's, that one's real quick. I mean, work was, whatever involvement he had in that one I'm, was surely complete right. fully at yeah. this point. Yeah, yeah, but I'm curious to see. I, look, it's morbid, but I'm sure some people within Ben and Namco are like, yes. Like, they're going to get such a weird boost for Sandland now being like, one of the final works from Akira Toriyama, you know? Like, I mean, it was one that I was sort of passively interested in, and now I was telling Brian J over at Game Informer, yeah. I was like, yeah, go ahead and commit me to the review. Like, I'm absolutely going to play that. <laughs> right, know? right. And I'm sure I'm not alone. And Jeff, I'm going to replay Blue Dragon, uh, his absolute favorite. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, do you have any thoughts on Toriyama? Wow us. Say something, you jackal. Um, you know, I, Dragon Ball has been a big blind spot for me. Um, so most of my interactions have been listening to you guys <laughs> go gaga for it. Um, and playing that, we played that one Dragon Ball game, the multiplayer Akira. one. Oh, yeah. So your legacy of Akira Toriyama is Dragon Ball the Breakers? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just right. that. No, that was, that was the Kakarot um, was, that actually followed the story. Of yeah, Z it was, it was, oh, it was right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot that you did play that. Yeah, I, I yeah, love I that played, Kakarot. I played some of that, great. but also at the same time, it feels like, yeah, I mean, I played Chrono Trigger. You, like you see his influences everywhere. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I, uh, the um, Dragon Quest, the Minecraft Dragon Quest game. Like, oh, like, like all of mine are very sure. tangential to to his, like his main creations that everyone actually knows him for, but that just kind of speaks to his kind of like omnipresence um, in all these different fields. Well, I think that's it. It's like Dragon Ball has such an impact on so many games you wouldn't think of, maybe obviously, of like, okay, there's maybe the obvious ones of, okay, Super Sonic would not exist by any means if it wasn't for Super Saiyans and all that stuff. Or even, I forget, Kyle, I think we are talking to Harada, about the impact of Toriyama on games, the the Tekken creator. Do you oh, remember this? Right. And he this, was saying yeah. that he's like, oh, well, obviously, like, Street Fighter took, like, so many moves. Like, Street Fighter wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Dragon Ball. And then Street Fighter had such an impact on the industry yeah, I mean, that kind of spread out from there. Is like, right. full Dragon Ball. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so it's just trying to plot that family tree of influences coming from Dragon Ball throughout the game industry. It's, it's impossible at this point. So I sent you that picture, which I'm a little, I was a little eyebrow raisy to it. I was like, "Eh, I don't know if that's quite one-to-one, but like cloud in, especially on the PlayStation one version of him, he looks almost exactly like Gohan, like, down to like the, the the like his belt and his hair and stuff, which is yeah, kind of I call shenanigans on that one. Like, I, yeah, I'm a little, but I mean, it, I Square and Dragon Quest and like in that era, it's like they were both like borrowing from each other so much, you yeah, know. Yeah, uh, but yeah, rest in peace, Kira Toriyama. Uh, it's sad day. Yeah, he, will, he will be missed absolutely. Like, uh, I, I'm curious what his last original character was because that was his big thing lately. Is mm. he would just pop in to make a character. I hope like, it's like, not. I, I, like I it hope. might have been that version of Cell <laughs> in the last movie. I think was like he might have drawn that. <laughs> that. To be fair, that movie rules. Dragon Ball Super, I love that movie, Superhero, yeah. right? Is that what that's called? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It could be. There's always his little favorite robot superhero guy. I forget his name. That's in Super in such a big way. Oh yeah. And I just yeah. I just hope it's not android 21 from dragon ball fighters uh because i forced myself to play through that story mode to get the full story of android 21 and no he he has absolutely added new characters since then for okay, sure good beyond just yeah. what if boo was a sexy lady <laughs> and i'm out <laughs> uh, hey, uh, make the checkout to a curatorial <laughs> <laughs> uh hey speaking of legends that'll never die jeff mark Yafava, folks um star wars dark forces uh, another Atari joint, strangely enough. This is from Night Dive Studios. Uh, Atari, I guess, technically was the publisher for uh, the Jeff Minter story, and now with Night Dive Studios, a studio they own, for this Star Wars remaster. This is another huge gap for me, Jeff. Um, Star Wars Dark Forces. There's a lot of, like, the Star Wars PC games that I can never keep track of. Um, this is the Doom clone that rules. Is that right? This, yes, this is the... Uh, and- like it came out in 95 um in my mind it was like they created they created well what doom came out in 93 sounds right 93 ish yeah so in my mind it was like 
I played Wolfenstein, I played Doom, I played Dark Forces, and Dark Forces was the first one where it's like, oh, it's also Star Wars, though, and so therefore it became, like, you know, my favorite video game for a stretch of period. Or really? at, at least in, like, at least in first, like, first-person shooter, like, that, that was kind of, it was its own new genre, and it was also, it, like, I mean, that ended up being my kind of main genre for many years um and the industry's main genre for many years but that that was like i have i have more vivid you know like hard set memories of dark forces than i than i did doom i i played more doom later in my like video gaming career Weird. than back in 93 um because at that point it was like i think i played the original doom on a friend's computer we we didn't even have a computer at that point before, you know, like Dark Forces was probably the first shooter that I really played on my own computer in my home. Whoa. Um, and so and so going and I, and I don't think I've been back to it since 95 either. So it was it was interesting to go back to. Um, it's I was surprised by how many little things I did remember from it, um, both good and bad. But it. It is very much in it is very much in that vein of boomer shooter doom. You move at an absurd pace, you know, yeah. speed. And it's I mean, like one look at it, you will you see the influences that this that this came hot on the heels of doom. But it had the Star Wars license and and also like was an original Star Wars story um, for that time, which was which was also cool. Yeah. Um, and the remastered seems like they knocked it out of the park. They faithfully <laughs> remastered that game. The other, <laughs> okay. The, okay. Okay. So, so the, the thing that I didn't understand back then, um, when I, when I played it as a kid was that the level design kind of sucks <laughs> and it, <laughs> and it still sucks. And and like, and it, it's, it would be easy to chalk it up as, it's a new genre people didn't know how to make, you know, first person shooter levels or levels in 3D. And that would be true if if id software didn't exist because because those doom levels are timeless and they do they're like you can play a doom level now and there's a snappiness to it and there's there's there are smart decisions in the design that I think makes doom still hold up today. Yeah. And and for Star Wars, you know, they're obviously trying to make you know, like they're trying to set them in places. Most of them aren't, you know, places, you know, from the movies or whatever, but it will be set on a ship or, you know, like these, these different places that are supposed to be in the Star Wars universe. But you can tell that the level design, like they just don't have the chops and they were clearly learning as they went. But like, is it there? Is it game there were you, times Jasmine, where huh? like, I was going to say, is it a game for you? Because my version of what you're talking about is Shadows of the Empire which I, I can't play that game objectively anymore. I just know the levels too well. It's just too nostalgic. I've replayed those levels so many times. So do you drop into this and you're like, well, I know where everything is. I know. No, I know what to do. Oh, OK. It's no, I no, I didn't. And so I, I feel like I am seeing it objectively for the first time. You know, like obviously I have n nostalgia for the game, the, you know, sound effects and the old bad Star Wars you know, MIDI music and everything are doing something for me. Like, like I am the target audience, I feel like for this remaster. But as I was playing through it, I realized, oh, this level design is just kind of absurd. There are places okay. where like to progress in a map, like you're looking for one skinny hallway that's tucked in at the end of, you know, this big room. And it's like, that in a doom level would be like a secret area because because it blends right in in that corner and you have to look at it from the right angle and who in their right mind would make that the path forward <laughs> that you're going to have to go in and out of that room 10 times yeah. to see or th or there's like there's <laughs> like the fourth level or something is like you you have to, you you have to meet this person who's in the resistance um and he's going to give you information about the next mission or whatever and they and they just tell you he lives on a planet um, that's like mostly sewer systems, oh, no. but he's hiding in the sewer systems. And so he has devised a series of tunnels 
and lever switches to hide where he is. So you have to go and find the right, find the switches and find the path to him in order to beat the level. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's an uninstall for me, bro. I, I would just immediately uninstall the game upon yeah. hearing that. You, you, you get dropped into this sewer area, which is actually kind of interesting because there are these channels and when you're in them, uh, it, it moves you like, like it's essentially like a conveyor belt, but you're sitting in what looks like sludge. And so you're kind of moving down these things, but there's one switch that opens up four different doors and you have to open one at a time and then go into that area and go around all these absurd. You're like falling and going into these different (laughs) channels and everything to find a switch in each one. And once you've triggered all of them, that opens up some other door and like the map is the classic doom map where you pull it up and it's basically just CAD like vector graphics that you can, it, it's, it's actually kind of helpful because you can have it just overlaid on your map and you're basically just watching your little triangle right. go around as you're trying to, but like there's, there's so much navigation nightmare and it's, and it just feels like, okay, you, you wanted this level to last 10 times longer than it should have taken just to like, make a full game out of this and it's part of it i i feel like is that kind of cynicism of like you're padding stuff out part of it is i do feel like they generally like the rest of the industry you know that didn't have romero was trying to figure out how to make 3d levels and make them interesting enjoyable while also doing it with this license which was just a, a lot of heavy lifting and created this very weird and interesting artifact i'm very happy that i went back to it um and you know spent a couple nights uh kind of reliving some of that but it is but i i don't think it's like required playing the way that the way that i would say do yeah still feels great yeah dark forces out again now everybody um also speaking of required gaming uh jeff this contra game that's like a remake of the original operation galuga Although I also heard Galuga, it's also yeah. kind of a sequel, um, but it, it's one of those sequels that just kind of repurposes all the originals, all the original levels and stuff. But anyways, new Contra game is technically out from way forward, which is exciting because they did Contra 4 back in the day, right? On DS that I think people yes, liked yeah. a fair bit. Contra 4 is good. Yeah. Hey, there we go. Um, how, yeah. much, how much have you been playing of Contra Operation Galuga? Have you completed the Galuga operation yet? I ha- I haven't. Okay. I'm I'm about mid Galuga. Okay, <laughs> you're a Galuga. Um, yeah, it's it's sure. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. good. Hang on, shut up. It's good, me. Kyle. Just to, just to yes and you. Yeah, every <laughs> level it's kind of like a game of horse. You get one letter in the word Galuga as you go through yeah. every oh, level okay. in the operation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they 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 made a new they made a new good contra game. Okay, uh, kind of in the vein of. Old Contra games, it is half remastered. Like the as I was playing through, I was like, this is the first level. I got right. to the I got to the boss, and the boss, you know, which just looks like half of a fort, like you're shooting at a fort. But then it, it there was there were like extra parts to that to that um that boss battle. Like and they there used to be uh like these weird kind of 3D 3D inter like in between other missions, there were we- there was there was a weird perspective that Contra fans will know what I'm talking about, where you're kind of going into the level, but you're still moving side to yep. side. That was that was very weird and awkward. And they have replaced that with other like weird vehicle missions. You're on a hover bike in one that's absurd. They have really ramped up the difficulty. It feels like for which is absurd to say because the difficulty on those games. Legendary. At least to me, you know, as someone who played it as a kid, even with the Konami code, like 30 lives wasn't cutting it. Um, and there are you you now have you now have a health bar. So you get hit three times before your character actually dies. And it feels like everything has been tuned to take that into account yeah. where you're just getting swarmed with enemies all the time. But as a side scroller, you know, side scrolling kind of shoot them up hybrid mix that what Contra has always been like it feels and looks like the old games you know it's not you know it's not like 16 bit or that kind of thing it's still polygonal but it it all looks and feels 
the way that I want a Contra game to. Too okay. much story that I don't give a crap about. <laughs> um, that was the wild part. Is I was looking it up and there's like cutscenes. It's like, it's just weird to see cutscenes with like animated versions of the Contra dudes. Yeah. Like I, no one's ever yeah, asked for this. Yeah. And by the Contra dudes, you mean the Arnold Schwarzenegger from Predator <laughs> and, and Stallone from Rambo. That's, yeah, the, that's the all Contra they're supposed dudes. to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now, now they talk more and, and there's, you know, there's some alien that comes in who's who they're setting up to be a villain, which no one gives a crap about. But um, <laughs> they they have they have added a, a progression system to it where you're earning points, and then there's a shop that you you um un, you basically unlock uh, different power ups and stuff. So like the first one I got was an extra guy, so now I have five guys for every level that I play and whatnot. And you can you can get more health and you can. Make it so that your love your weapons are upgraded when you get them the first time, and that that feels like it's a bit of a grind, but it's you know it kind of helps balance out the difficulty curve that there is to it. Um, and the checkpoints are are pretty decent. Like there is usually one or two within a level, so if you do die, you you can start right back from where that checkpoint is. That's not always enough. Like I'm stuck on one level where it's like. I'm at the checkpoint, and between the checkpoint and getting to the end boss of that level, like I'm, st- I'm still just like five guys is not doing it. Yeah, um, and so I'll probably have to do some more upgrades. But it feels good, and it has local swap for two player, which I think it's up know, to four players. Is what I was looking at. Possibly. <laughs> so that's cool so, that they're dude. squeezing even more guys in there. But I'm playing on a Steam Deck, so I'm not going to be playing locally with anyone. Um, just but a cool it is, guy playing great, by yourself. Yeah, no, that's, yep, that's a good way to live a, your life. It's a great uh, Steam Deck option. So, like, if you're if you're a fan of the old ones and you've been by some of the other interlopers in there, like this this is a solid one. That's nice. Uh, Operation Galuga, everybody. Uh, I am curious about the soundtrack and Konami posted. By the way, it's just fun to have Konami releasing games again. Yes, it's kind of a remake of Contra One, but. I, I'm excited even to see this from them, to see this sign of life, you know? And last year, that Super yeah, Crazy like, Rhythm Castle I thought was cool that they published, and it's fun to have them out there again. If if you're if you're such a massive fan of Contra that you're like, oh, I know this level, all right, then I don't know what to tell you. You've played too much Contra in your life. <laughs> yeah, uh, but they, they posted on YouTube a tease of the soundtrack. I just want to hear it. I want to hear what they did to the Contra soundtrack here. It. Yeah. But wait. Okay. And it better kick in hard. Checks out. No, no. You had 20 <laughs> seconds, you blew it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, nope. hey, hey, I mean, that's what Contra sounds like. <laughs> I guess, you know? kind of, sort of. Kelsey, you know how this whole thing operates? Ooh, um, Pat Patterson, pocket run. <laughs> what the hell? Are you Patreon. <laughs> Patterson oh, pocket there we go. <laughs> That's where everybody go to pattersonpocketron.com slash minmax min-max mascot. <laughs> you don't know what Patterson pocket, pocket run? run. Patterson <laughs> pocket pocket. He's the run? coolest guy around. <laughs> You go there, you find a tier that's right for you, help support independent games media, and you support us at a level that's sustainable for you, and that keeps us sustainable as well. So go there and unlock a benefit. Give it a whirl. If you support us this week uh, on Patreon, there's a very good chance I'll be DMing you on Patreon and asking if you want a code. We have a ton of codes to give away for stuff like Dragon's Dogma 1 in pre-release or in preparation for that new game coming out. We still have Thirsty Suitors codes to give away. Uh, An infinite amount of Xbox... Uh, games to give away as well so support us on patreon and very good odds uh you'll be getting a dm for me and if not we'll give you a refund if if we have no codes left for you uh hey uh stamps.com everybody it's the post office elevated uh thank you to some of our bigger supporters like stamps.com they want everybody to know that you don't have to go to the post office anymore with all due respect to this post office you're kind of a schlub if you go there because with stamps.com it's like having a post office in your house right kelsey lewin that's absolutely right. I use it all the time. Yeah, and for shipping out everything, I mean, to the point of it's genuinely stupid to do anything if you're shipping out a lot of things other than use stamps.com? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing I don't understand is why people still stand in lines at post offices because you just, you don't have to. You as they, they send you a scale, right? Like right. part of signing up is they send you a little scale. So you've got everything now. You can just 
You can just put it together, weigh it, and pay for it through stamps.com, and then you can just, you don't have to wait in line. You just go up to the front of the post office and put it on the counter and leave. Done deal, everybody. For 25 years, stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses, whether they're mailing out checks, invoices, legal documents, books, or anything else. Get access to USPS and UPS mailing services you need to run your business right from your computer anytime, day or night, Kyle. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. It's the stress-free solution. So you can keep your mailing and shipping moving at the speed of your business with stamps.com. Sign up with promo code MINMAX for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and that free digital scale we hear so much about. There are no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page and enter code MinMax. Stamps.com, thank you for supporting the show. Also, thank you to Fume. Remember this weird thing? A design to help you kick bad habits. Jeff, you recall this, this thing? I do. <laughs> okay. The overall idea is there's nothing, there's nothing in here. There's no, there's no magic. Uh, you're not lighting this thing up in any way, but if you are trying to kick some bad habits, Fume uh, might be helpful for you because the whole idea is you're just breathing air through it. There's nothing electronic, there's nothing, but it's a nice thing to fidget with, a nice thing to just breathe air through. They have like flavored air packets that you can put in there if you want, but again, it's just, it doesn't heat up in any way. So if you're looking to kick your nasty habits to the curb, and also if you just want a really fun thing to play with, you've probably noticed that even on weeks for the podcast when we aren't doing a ad read for Fume, I'm still playing with this because it is, Kyle, as a fellow fidget guy, if you ever got your hands on this Fume device, your hands would never leave it. You'd sleep with it. You'd shower <laughs> with fume. I swear to God, it's so fun to play with. I am always on the lookout for fun fidget devices. I dare you to try it. Uh, and they say, instead of vapor, fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses delicious flavors as you're breathing air through it. So you can start the year off by going to tryfume.com slash minmax, getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use the code MINMAX to help make kicking your bad habits that much easier. So tryfume.com slash MINMAX. There's a link in the description for if you're interested in such a thing. Also, shout out to our dear friends at I Am 8-Bit. They want everybody to know about Day of the Devs, everybody. Day of the Devs is happening in... Oh my gosh. This weekend, Sunday, March 17th from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific in San Francisco, California. This is a free event, totally free. You can RSVP by going to daythedevs.com. Check out that site for more info on how this whole thing works. But if you're in the San Francisco area, you want to play a bunch of indie developers games and meet indie developers themselves. Also likely meet Leo, Janet, Haley and I will be at that event. Uh, you can go there, go to daythedevs.com, find out more info and then swing by on March 17th in San Francisco. There will be over 70 games there. And, Look, I don't want to promise anything, but your odds have never been higher of seeing Tim Schafer in person and thanking him than if you go to this free event at Day of the Devs. He's going to be there, everybody. Probably. I don't know this for sure, but he's involved, I'd imagine. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, help support I Am 8-Bit because uh, they make stuff like Day of the Devs possible. And they support MinMax in a big way by shipping out a prize each and every week to whoever has the best question submitted over there on Patreon. You go to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends uh even at that two dollar tier you can submit a question each and every week we choose our number one favorite and that person wins a prize and thanks to i made bit the prize this week is the untitled goose game vinyl soundtrack thank you for shipping that out and if you're at i made bits wonderful online store which really should be your homepage at this point because there's so much cool stuff you can use the promo code thin mints Thin Mints for 10% off of everything under $100 in their wonderful online store. So please check it out. Y'all ready for community questions? Let's do it. Y'all ready oh, for yeah. star time? Uh, Jeff, I'm, <laughs> I was going to ask, how much James Brown have you listened to in your life? But then I remembered you had that weird story about James Brown that I think we saved on a podcast post-show yeah. discussion a while back. We, we, we don't have to get into that. J J Jeff is the biggest James Brown fan. He, Enough. He sings, Enough he sings James much. Brown multiple times a day. Um, anyways, uh, Gatlin Machine writes in, and they say, salutations, min-pilled maxers. Uh, I don't know. Sure. Uh, they say, a week or two ago, someone, and I don't remember who, I'm sorry, <laughs> mentioned that RTS games are esoteric dad games on the podcast. 
I don't remember who that was. I think it was Haley. Um, I grew up watching my dad. I'm just kidding. It was Sarah. I grew up watching my dad play SOCOM. Okay, this is fascinating. Thank you, Gatlin, for writing in about this. I grew up watching my dad play SOCOM multiplayer on the PS2. And I think him explaining online games while playing SOCOM multiplayer on the PS2 is what kickstarted my brain into recording conscious memory. It was mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine, like, first memory on Earth is your dad playing SOCOM on PS2. That's the best. Uh, anyways, I actually inherited his username, Gatlin Machine, from that. Oh, that's nice. Uh, my parents had their honeymoon in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and he's big. A, he's been a big tooling engineer his whole life. I see. Has anyone else got cool gamer dad lore? <laughs> Any other dad-flavored games? Ah, uh, the dad-flavored games, yeah. Cool gamer dad lore. What jumps out for folks? I mean, my my dad willingly brought one video game in the house that I think he intended to play, and that was Mist. Oh yeah, and that and that's about that was about it. He was never like, "This is stupid, and I hate what you're doing." But he was never like, he never played a video game other than Mist. I think Mist is the only video game I ever think I saw him play. Are you not playing RBI baseball with him at any point? That seems like a huge <laughs> swing and a miss. Like he never I, got into any I've baseball like, games. I think I've like mentioned like, oh, dad, you should try like a baseball game sometime. But like, I, I he's just not. He doesn't want to play video games. He's not interested. What about, he's also like an a, he's also an incredible guitarist. And I showed him Rock Band, and yeah. he played that for a minute, and it was like, oh, that's kind of charming. But I'm gonna go like rip a solo on this mandolin in the neighboring room. <laughs> <laughs> And just giggle like a madman. Yeah. Uh, do you think you or your brother have the laugh from your dad more? I I don't I don't know I don't I can't okay well let's we'll think let think backstage pass vote on that we'll see how the results come in. <laughs> uh, Kelsey, dad, big baseball game guy. So that was the only type of game he did try to play. Okay. He got my my first console was his Game Boy that he bought to play baseball on airplanes with and then just never really never really got I I maintain that he would have been a really big gamer if he was born in the right time because I've seen like notebooks from his childhood where he's like making mock baseball games and mock soccer games and stuff and i'm like okay if like mlb the show existed when you were a kid like you would have been so so into it but he didn't have that and by the time you know by the time games were sophisticated enough to do those kind of simulations and stuff i think he was just over it but um but my partner's dad is really interesting because he's a very just like serious guy who you know he's got like a painting company and stuff just total uh, you know, blue collar guy like that. And, um, he plays every MMO, like oh, weird. every huh. single MMO he's weird. been playing Eve since like 2003. Whoa. He, like, yeah. I mean, just, is he like an EverQuest never... guy? Is that how it started? Okay. Yeah. Um, and you would just absolutely never expect it looking at him. Cause he just looks like capital D dad. Um, but he's, <laughs> he's got his hands in every single MMO. Do you think, I don't know. Maybe I just have a dark, weird mind, but like, is he like living out some weird other life fantasies? Is it kind of like a second life equivalent for dads? Do you think that are that into MMOs? Like, does he have like online wives and shit? like what, what's going on over there? You know, I haven't asked him if he has online. Wives. <laughs> Could you ask him? <laughs> Could we call him up on air and ask him if he has other online? Wives? Cause someone who's that into MMOs, like there has to be something more than just watching numbers go up. Right. Like it has to be a social thing for him. Yeah, yeah I think I think he's got like a guild that he plays basically every MMO with, like the same group of people that that go to all of them. But yeah, I've always found that really fascinating. Just I love that. I don't know. Yeah, I, my dad, I could. There's nothing in the world I could do to get him to touch a video game ever, <laughs> in my entire <laughs> life. But you know, so I wish I wish I had a cool gamer dad. But I guess he really likes uh, like cribbage. You know, so I guess he's a gamer in his own kind of way. He makes cribbage boards, if that counts as being a gamer dad. I don't know. You got to find him a digital cribbage game. He would say, why in God's name would I ever do this? I That's could be true. playing or making <laughs> cribbage boards. Get out I, of my face. I was just going to ask if he's made his own cribbage board. Oh, he, he's obsessed with answers. it. He's made thousands of them, yeah. Yeah, my my dad, um, he, our first system was a Bally Astrocade, which was his, but I have never seen him play it. Um, <laughs> but we, when we would go to, you know, my parents' friend's house who had kids our age, 
they, we would pl- he'd play Duck Hunt over there. Like Duck Hunt was an easy in um, for him and their dad. Um, and then when we finally got a Super Nintendo, he would play Mario Kart with us. Ooh, that's and that good. Was, that's like just easy enough. And he would kick his legs when he was trying to go around a corner, you know, and do the turning. And then he would accuse us of using cheat codes when we beat him. So <laughs> he knew the word perfect. cheat code. That's sweet. Yep. Yep. I, that made me just remember that my dad did love one game, and it was uh, Deli Bird's Delivery, the mini game in Pokemon Stadium 2 of on the course. N64. Yeah. He loved course, playing Deli Bird's different. Delivery specifically with me. Okay, so delivering presents, shooting mm-hmm. birds, racing cars, hitting baseballs. That's dad stuff? Is that what we're learning today? And solving uh, sort of ephemeral puzzles that are <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> ultimately impossible unless you have a walkthrough of some kind. Which, by the way, Kelsey, I enjoyed your episode of Jenna Sieber's podcast. Uh, big. Oh, thank you. What, big Game Hunter? What's the name of the podcast again? Hunger. Big Game Hunter. Big Game Hunger. Sorry, forgive me. Um, where you were designing a version of Mist, but you're kissing a frog throughout all of it. And I saw <laughs> somebody got to it on Twitter, but... I absolutely was screaming into my phone because you all were like, yeah, and then maybe we can make a sequel. I don't know what you'd call a sequel for a frog-based mist game. I was like, just call it Rivet. Like, just, just right there. <laughs> Combine Rivet and Rivet. It's right there. But you didn't hear me despite me screaming uh, lazy puns at you. Next time. Uh, the, the, other thing I liked, the other thing I liked about this question is oh, yeah. now I'm in the dad game position. <laughs> And it's funny because like my my kid walks in and I'm playing Rebirth and she's very much just like, looks like you're a fantasy dude hitting stuff with a sword. I'm moving on to my own stuff. No <laughs> jokes. Does so she have to be so me. condescending? Well, what is this tone? Come on. I don't know. She that's she calls she calls. I think she has called them dad games before. She's like, <laughs> if you're like beating stuff up, that's just a dad game. I'm going to go play Roblox in Stardew Valley. Man, I had a very satisfying moment this last weekend where I was babysitting the nephews for like four days. It was like the longest stretch ever. Um, and so I was playing Rebirth on the PlayStation Portal and they actually got into like watching me play Rebirth, which I didn't expect because they're just all in on Fortnite at this point. Mm. Um, but then it was very fun because like, oh, how does it work? Okay, so you can pause it and then you choose your spells. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's like, you know, as a as a huge dork, it melted my heart because then we were jumping around on the trampoline later. And then they're like, okay, well, let's play, let's play the cloud game. Okay, so if I yell spell, then everyone has to pause and then we do a spell and like them That's asking cute. me for like different spells they could use or like, and I did pitch them like, okay, use Farag on him, then use gravity on him. I was like, okay, this is, this is and like, no, 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 you don't have Cura yet. You stay on the ground. <laughs> yeah, don't you even think about range. region, buddy. You don't Come have on. enough MP to do that spell. <laughs> Sit uh, down. Uh, 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 build up your ATB bar. Come on. Um, Patrick G writes in with a very topical question says, hello, what's your shoot? I'm becoming my parents moment. I've become anal about leaving lights on when leaving a room and that's mine. But are you all becoming so, your parents? Um, it, Ooh. Am I just on the dad podcast right now? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, let's all talk about trimming our nose hairs next. This is going to be freaking sweet, but <laughs> yeah. Do you all have moments of becoming your parents? It doesn't need to be a dad. Kelsey, you yeah. can become anybody. I mean, it's that it's just sense of humor for me. Mm. I just see myself slowly adopting my father's sense of humor, which I always liked. I think my dad is a a sort of a, a, a funny guy, but it's it is it is wild. But I, that I'll make a joke around everyone and I'll just be like, oh, my God, that is that is 100 percent a joke that Ted would make. <laughs> this podcast dedicated to Ted. <laughs> Jeff, um. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have, this? I mean, the past like three years has just been the constant, a rolling revelation of, and the, the thing that I realized about it is that like, I always thought, Hey, my dad's, cr- my dad, I think my dad is in the basement right now. So I don't want to <laughs> oh, okay. Get him on the show. <laughs> he He's helping. He's helping me fix my laundry machine because my laundry machine just broke. Um, but what I, and so like, I thought he was crazy and that I'm nothing like him. And then what I read in the past few years is that I was comparing the kid version of me to the dad version of my dad. And I don't know what the kid version of my dad was like, but now that I'm becoming the dad, I can compare the dad version of me to the dad version I've always known of my dad. Right. And it's a lot closer than I, than I ever realized. We had, we had my, my wife's, um, 
sister and her friend were over and her her friend was dyeing my sister-in-law's hair one time during the winter and it was like it was like 20 below out and my my wife and I went out we went out to dinner and, and when we came back they had the heat in the house was up to like 86 <laughs> degrees because because they were they were dyeing her hair in the bathroom but there were fumes from the bleach so they opened the window but it was super cold outside so their answer was to just turn the heat up to like 85 degrees <laughs> and I came in I was like what the hell are you doing don't ever touch the thermostat again <laughs> and then I realized oh my god like this is it this is it but it's it's the responsibilities that I know now having paid for the heat in the house I can confidently say, do you know how much it costs to heat a house? Just put a sweater on or just don't dye your hair in the middle of the winter. What? <laughs> or do it at your house. Come on. If you're under if you're under my roof, it's my rules. All yeah. all those classics uh, are now I'm I'm living them. I did have a weird yeah, really. moment with yeah. my parents uh, a while ago where they came to come visit the baby um, and the baby was crying a little bit. Um, and. <laughs> They asked like, like, oh, how do we get him to stop crying? I was like, what do you mean? You guys are the experts. Like, we're not the experts. Like, this is, you're much more the expert than we are. And I was like, oh my God, you've raised three kids, but I guess it was 30 years ago. Uh, so I guess now I have to be the new expert on how to take care of this baby, which is a weird thing to talk to your parents about. But there it is. Um, Mars Barrow, um, and he hasn't stopped crying since, by the way. We haven't solved that problem. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> if anyone has any tips. Mars Barrow writes in and says, hey, cohorts, hope you're doing well. Uh, how important are palate cleanser games to you? How often do you prefer to find a simple game after a bigger or heavier game or a gameplay session? I, um, I stumble into them constantly, and it's only reflecting on them that I'm like, oh, actually, that was perfect. Like recently, between like a dragon and rebirth i played suicide squad mm. and that was like weirdly even though that game was ultimately underwhelming that was like the perfect like little dip into a weird action shooter that i needed between two massive rpgs but i didn't plan it that way it just worked out that way yeah you just kind of need something dumb between big games no offense to suicide squad or like classic too Ooh, like okay. I, I'll, I'll often play like you know Mario Land 2 or something and not all the way through but just something like after I finish a big RPG or something you know play that for like an hour and a half and then you're like okay I've, yeah. I've reset my brain a little bit yep or something a little bit more twitch focused I think you know than a, a big RPG totally um Ricky Maru writes in and says uh Rise of the Ronin is my most anticipated game for the year It'll be the first game directed by Fumihiko Yasuda since Neo 2 in 2020. In the past, Team Ninja has made an effort to focus on gameplay over presentation, leading to some of the best combat systems out there. However, I've already seen from the preview coverage a lot of the gaming community start to bash Rise of the Ronin's visuals. In a time when AAA games are at risk of long development times, cancellations, and layoffs, shouldn't we be celebrating smaller or mid-sized games that have a focus like Rise of the Ronin? I like that question a lot. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, yes, is the answer. <laughs> Moving on, but it's but an like, odd does thing. that does that always necessarily mean that like it's not made under crunch or not like you it's know tough, like I don't right? know that that's just a direct like oh because it's not as visually impressive or whatever that means that people didn't work as hard and they all went to sleep on time and saw their families like right I, it's it's impossible to try and see behind the curtain right of trying to figure out what the measurement systems should be but you look at this compared to i'm confident it's probably a healthier to, well I, I can't even say that <laughs> i can't even say yeah. that the development was healthy right but i do i do like that idea but it's just a weird spot for the press to be like okay the industry is going through such a tough time right now you should never say a game doesn't look amazing. Uh, never point that out. It's like, well, you can yeah. call it out. Like if it's broken and janky, I suppose. But if it's just not Naughty Dog level visuals, like I guess call it out, but don't say tisk tisk tisk. Bad game because yeah. of that. I guess is the the fine line. 
by the way, the yeah. reason I was like stumbling is like I was like, can I talk about that game? And I like I just looked up at the embargo, <laughs> and it, it I have played a little bit of it. And oh. it, it 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 lifted the, the preview embargo lifted a couple days ago. Um, but I, I I see where they're coming from because I I only played like the first hour because I wanted to get back to Rebirth. Yeah. But I did have a moment where I was like, oh this this doesn't look as sharp as it did in the uh, in like trailers. Oh, and interesting. Stuff like that. Okay. But it was not one of those things that like I knocked the game for it. It was just like, oh, this my expectation was was not met in the way I expected it to. Now let me focus on other facets of the game and, and see how that plays and what it feels like because that stuff ultimately is so much more important to me. Yeah, yeah. Are 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 we expecting are are, are we expecting Rise of the Ronin not to be like a mid level budget game though? Isn't it still like aiming to be a very large? triple a game and it's just i don't it's a know playstation exclusive right it is but it seems like yeah. the easy comparison is it's just going to be a, a wolong style game right or it's, it's not style but i guess because it's more open world than that uh yeah but that scope of game which is double a probably if i had to quantify it in some gross arbitrary way yeah but i mean i absolutely yeah. want to like celebrate that stuff but yeah I, i'm i guess i don't know if it's exactly what you're saying ben but it's like that doesn't mean we can't identify criticisms with the game right i mean that's that's just what the game is right right am i misunderstanding the question there have there have certainly been kind of budget games hellblade is like an example of like you can you can do smaller budget things and still have it look good and if a and so i i don't know that it that you can like that we should be avoiding criticizing something just because of that. And and like this this seems like a weird test. This game seems like a weird test case for our critics cool with kind of mid mid budget games because I guess right. I I guess in my mind it wasn't falling into that bucket in the first place. I think that is the test. And you know, it kind of ties in a little bit with Helldivers 2 success, I guess, of like I don't know if I consider that a quote unquote triple A thing. And it seems like gamers are very much cool with that. Like, yeah, the yeah. the cape's gonna look a little bit janky at times, but you know what? For a forty dollar game, this is exactly what the world wants at this point. And it could There's a reason that Hell Divers mostly wear helmets. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Which Kelsey, it blew my mind. You're getting into Hell Divers too? Yeah, I'm super into it, which I have not been into a game like this in a very long time. And I um, you know, I credit easily half of it to it being not pvp uh because right. it's given me a chance to become better at games where you shoot things as opposed to just getting destroyed immediately and you know being uh, told i'm stupid and whatever and <laughs> don't belong in video games so uh, <laughs> but is it is it's it a tying weird tangent no, no, no. <laughs> is it tying into like some monster hunter vibes for you though since you're such a huge fan yes of that? totally yeah oh, it perfect. is it yeah. is the exact same thing where i'm just getting a group of people together um but it's not like shooters are not the game I normally do that for. And so I've just been super pleasantly surprised with how, um, how my, you know, group of people I know have just been into this and I can join, you know, join different groups of friends every night. And like, sometimes we're more successful than others, but like just having a really good time with it in a way that I, I haven't done with, uh, online games really since monster hunter, I guess. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. Um, yeah, back to Ricky Maru's question though about that idea of you know AAA games and celebrating mid-sized games. I just had like a a scared thought where you know we've talked about the fact that there's so many layoffs on the industry, but it seems like Nintendo has been remarkably stable. And with the rest of the industry budgets getting to 200, 300 million dollars to create a game, and it takes six to seven years to develop these new AAA games, and if they don't get near uh, making their money back and these studios just implode and that's just not a sustainable way to, to grow this business. I was thinking about just Nintendo and what a funky spot they're in and how technically they're still kind of somewhere in between an Xbox 360 and Xbox One, I guess, right? For the level of fidelity that they're at. And it's like, it, I am so curious to see how they're going to adapt to this. You know, they're kind of looking ahead for the future of tech. like The, it, the it, same way they always have been. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but do you think, I guess this is silly, because in my mind then I was thinking about like, oh, is, is it just going to slow down all of their development as well if they're upping the Maybe. fidelity for the Switch 2 in a huge way, and then that's going to lead to a less safe, stable world for them over there? 
uh, if the well, budgets I mean, for their games you know are that ballooning. It's, it's not that Nintendo is like super kind and nice. It's that there are different laws in Japan about when you can and cannot lay people off. Yes. And so you can't just do the like, well, shareholders need to see line go up so we can we can cut costs by dropping 200 developers after this game comes out. Like they, they, they can't do that in Japan. And so part of the stability is just that. <laughs> yep, for sure. But I'm thinking specifically also just about like the, the game budgets. You know, I'm sure a Tears of the Kingdom budget, God, I'd love to know. I'm sure that's 150 million. I, I have no idea. It would be my guess, right? But I mean, there's so much stuff like in that Princess Peach Showtime. Like it's crazy. That's a big first party game they're releasing this year. And I'm sure that budget is 120th of the average AAA budget from Sony or Microsoft at this point. Um, which, yes, which I think, I think speaks to the kind of games that they make aren't, you know, technology driven in the same way. If the Switch comes out and it's twice as powerful, that doesn't mean that they're going to make games that are twice as big or that the next not. Mario is going to be, you know, twice as advanced and need that much horsepower. Like, they're going to always continue making the games that they make and they're probably just adding the power because that's what every other developer and publisher is asking for so that they can make games for it too. But I, I wouldn't expect them to, like fall over themselves or start taking seven years for them to make the kind of games they make because they've never cared about follow, you know, following those trends to begin with. They make, they make like tears of the kingdom feels very much like an exception to a lot of the games that Nintendo make because that yeah. one was so much more, you know, bigger and more advanced and they were trying to do things that were a little more intensive from a hardware perspective. But you know, but the, that the next side-scrolling Mario game that they make. Well, you know, like Mario Wonder 2 is like, they're not, they're not waiting on the next chipset in order to pull off whatever that's going to be. Yeah, but it's funny to think of like, you know, big AAA studios from Sony and Microsoft spending so long, uh, so much time just to create these games and then look at Nintendo and it's like, oh, I hope they don't get into that system and that cycle, but then it's like, well... I mean, Mario Odyssey was a long time ago. There's <laughs> yeah. like a huge gap between all the Zeldas now, even though they're still technically maybe a generation and a half behind. It seems like the pacing for the game releases is still roughly on par. Let with me tell else. you about the Nintendo 64. I'm listening. I'm listening. Uh, Brian Ventura writes in. I appreciate this. Uh, they say, hey, man, Max, somewhat recently, uh, Ben Hansen on the podcast poo-pooed verticality in game design after a bad experience with Suicide Squad. And I thought, wait a minute, there's no way anyone can hate on the Z axis. Up and down equals fun. So thank you for defending the Z axis here, says uh, from Brian. He says, uh, can someone on the show please champion three dimensional space and games for me? And then Brian, this is what I appreciate. They say, my favorite vertical experiences in games and why it isn't just a BS talking point, learning you can fly in Rocket League. Sure. Not knowing which way is up in Outer Wilds. Falling for infinity in Portal. Finding yeah. secret passages and sealing vents in Dishonored. Thank you, Brian. Very reasonable vertical uh, things to champion. Everybody uh, trade in. Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> There's Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> That's <Absolutely. across> everything. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Dis Dishonored seems like a, a good counterpoint to the argument that you were making. Yeah. But the argument that you were making was more like, it always feels like it's a shooter where... People are people are saying like, oh, it's all about verticality in Far Cry X or whatever. And it's like it's not it's not fun to be like trying to look up and around in a shooter. And like, what is that? I still feel like you had a valid point. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the example is Gears of War, which is like by design a very horizontal game. Mm, so right. that was one that I you're right. It is a little funky to be like you're not climbing or going up and down quickly in Gears of War just by the nature of the design. It is a very chunky shooter that you sort of plant your feet in one part and then plant your feet in another part. Is it Dark Void that has like Gears of War but going vertical? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that was great. We all agree. Yeah. Um, no, uh, Trufo in the chat is right saying Leo would talk about the finals. And I think Leo even jumped into Backstage Pass to champion the finals, the finals for vertical design and multiplayer at least. Um, Bloody Waffle writes in and says... I'm from Latin America and Dragon Ball was everything 
everywhere growing up. Uh, now in my 30s, I get teary-eyed when I listen to the Dragon Ball Z opening in Spanish because all of the childhood memories attached to it. Is there a cartoon show or show opening that stirs you up? I had one recently where, for some reason, I was thinking about Digimon, probably because I'm 37 years old and a dork. And um, and then I just, I booted up that Digimon season one intro to be like, is this intro as good as I remember it being? Uh, Digivolve into Champions, a classic theme. And the first 20 seconds of that intro, I was pumping my fist in the air. I'm like, this song rules. This is so good. Why don't I listen to this more often? And then the rest of the song, it pivoted hard and I was like, wait, I think this might actually be a bad dumb song for the opening <laughs> of the Digimon. I forgot that one kind of peters out at the end, but the feeling from the Digimon opening still gets yeah. me. I mean, I get, I, I pull up the Ninja Turtles opening sometimes because that that opening was so much better than the actual show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It looks so good. Right. Uh, I guess X-Men. DuckTales. Was DuckTales. Also, uh, DuckTales yeah. is a really good one. Darkwing yeah. Duck. Yeah, everything will get you. Oh, and, the, and, and Batman the Animated Series is a fantastic one as well. But that's also just Danny Elfman. Like, that's not specific to the show. Right, right. Yeah. That's tricky. Uh, Justin Shen. I mean, Pokemon's Ooh. really iconic, too. Like, yeah, it's yeah, still... True. I don't know if it makes me teary-eyed, but, like, it, any room full of millennials can just bust out into that song at any time. So. It's true. But it's weird. And this feels like an elitist thing to say, so stop me if it does. Just cut my mic. But there's also a part of me that always feels like with the Pokemon anime, like, yeah, that intro is iconic. But when I think... Pokemon music, it's like there are uh, 15 songs from Red and Blue that are more iconic and hit me more in the gut emotionally than like that Pokemon intro. So I always feel like, oh, okay, that's know. that's for the masses, you know, when it comes to Pokemon I don't know music. that it's more iconic, like better probably, but... Sure, like, yes, you right. You know, that's the one that has lyrics, I think, is what it really comes down. Like you can sing that one with your friends yeah. and not, yeah. not so much with any of the other songs. Like I remember when Pokemon Go was huge, we were playing in a park late at night in Seattle in Bellevue. Um, and somebody was driving their car around with all the windows down, blasting the Pokemon show intro, and that they couldn't be blasting Viridian Forest and have that much of a reaction. <laughs> I don't think so. That's Everyone right. sing along. <laughs> that specific park in Bellevue, by the way, that yeah. was that was nuts. There was there. I went I went to that one too. Probably not at the same time, but maybe. Um, and you just have the parts kind of shaped like a circle, and you just have like this moving mass of yes. people just slowly rotating in a circle until someone would inevitably yell out like Snorlax and then everyone <laughs> would bolt to the other side of the park. It was just, it's we must have time. all looked so insane that week. Like, yeah, no, uh, literally everyone was playing. So like nobody looked yeah, insane. That's true. Everyone knew what was going on. Was but if you woke up from a coma in the middle of that and like <laughs> yeah. walked by that park and saw that. <laughs> Uh, it was a better time back when we had a video game reason to run around a park at night. Um, Justin Chen writes in and they say, what kind of cultural I effect do you think Akira Toriyama had on the world outside of visual media? For example, says Justin, I'm pretty sure he had some sort of impact on fitness culture from Dragon Ball Z. Oh, yeah. I yeah. think there is. And this really got to me. It's like, yeah, I do think there has to be more people out there because I know for sure when I got into Dragon Ball Z, I went out and bought weights because of it. And look how I turned out. Uh, no, but like it really didn't have an impact on like me wanting to care about my body a little bit more because I wanted to look like Gohan. Or Jeff has modeled his entire physique off of Kid Boo. Obviously, we've said it a thousand <laughs> times. And you started so eating specific. more vegetables because of Vegeta? Yes, that's exactly right. Well, I just started right. eating voraciously constantly because of Goku. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you get a nosebleed every time you see panties. I mean, Kyle, it's such a huge impact on you overall. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, Joe uh, writes in and says, sad that he won't be on the panel for this, but nonetheless, I want you all to know that Jacob Geller is writing a book. It's not a question. It's that's, lost, yeah, uh, just cool jubilation. Help. Yeah, uh, it's collaborating with Jacob. Lost and Cult, which I'm not cool enough. I wasn't familiar with them. Apparently, Lost and Cult's a big deal. Everybody knows Lost and Cult. <laughs> Kelsey, can you They're fill awesome. me in on yeah. what they are, who they are? Yeah, it's a... It's a British publisher that just does cool video game stuff. They've done some, it's all like long form, interesting video game deep dive stuff. It's all stuff you'd be into. Oh, okay. All right. That's probably a sign that I should probably get into it. But yes, they're collaborating with Jacob Geller and uh, he's making a book all about his video essays and a, a whole lot more. And it's truly awesome art. If you haven't seen the art for this thing yet, I guess it's like 
selling out and breaking records and all that stuff. But look up Jacob Geller's book because the art is incredible. And I assume the words are good too. <laughs> um, let's see. Nate Voris uh, says, not sure if you still do these on the podcast, but I have an extremely late missed joke opportunity. I've been rewatching the Chrono Cross Deepest Dive. And at one point, Ben is insistent about discussing the game's events in chronological order. And I kept waiting for someone to say in Chrono Crossical order and nobody ever did. That's all. Thank you. Have a great week. Sorry. Thank you, Nate. Thank you for writing in with that. I appreciate it. We, we've been getting less of those just because we nail every joke, I assume. <laughs> That's right. Oh, when yeah, we, earlier you said something about miss. baseball and then said it was a swing and a miss and you just got it instantly. So I, <laughs> yeah, that we're, we're really on top of it now. And Kyle <laughs> took the time for that Operation Galuga joke. Like, we all are hitting everything <laughs> here. Uh, Ross Adams uh, continues to roast me saying, um, so one Ben Hansen claimed that Miles Morales' powers being named Venom would be confusing because of the villain also named Venom. I stand by that being dumb. Um, anyways, they say, and yet one Ben Hansen now has a podcast on MinMax called Bonus Pod, which is on the Bonus Podcast feed, which contains things other than just Bonus Pod. What is that about? <laughs> hey, look, man, we never said we're perfect. I still think that's better than Miles having Venom powers when he's fighting Venom and they never talk about it. Uh, but yeah, the Bonus Podcast feed, it's got so much more than just Bonus Pod. But also let the record show that was uh, Leo and Haley's idea. Uh, but Captain Cobblepot wrote in. Uh, they say, greetings, MinMaxers. If you could choose any permanent brand slash store discount of 50% off for life, what would you choose? I was thinking about how often I buy Cliff Bars and it can benefit greatly from a steep discount. P.S. Hit me up on Discord if you work for Cliff Bars. Oh, uh, okay. I guess that could work. Yeah, well, the what's... answer is Amazon. Oh, Done. boring. Out of here. <laughs> Smoke bomb. Yeah. I mean, my my equally boring answer is Target. Target. It's Target, man. That's pretty good. <laughs> Chan yeah. in the Backstage Pass just says, the house store? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for having Backstage Pass on the screen. Um, it's so much better to have the chat shared with everybody. Yeah, this is not the correct answer, but I've just been thinking about it a lot because I've been trying to collaborate with them and it's not working. But I love the restaurant that's only in the upper Midwest called Lian Shin, the Chinese <laughs> restaurant. And so I've been talking to them about like, hey, could we eat your food in the studio? <laughs> you could give us free food. <laughs> like The same thing that we have for the beer with Uta Pills and stuff, which is a great deal for us. And I've got him to the point of, if you tell us a date in the future, we might be able to get you free food on that day, which that Damn, to me, fun. that's the greatest discount I could ever hope for is one day, two years from now, we'll eat Lian Chin in the studio and it'll technically <laughs> be free. And that sounds great. And we'll all have my reaction, which is like, well, I don't think I'll be coming back here again. <laughs> <laughs> to Lian Chin, the greatest Chinese restaurant in the world. Uh, uh, I had it once. Yeah. Kelsey Pinkerilla probably. Set that out, by the way, if you that. want to maintain this uh, whole thing. They don't listen to this podcast. They're Lian Chin. They're a Chinese <laughs> restaurant from North Dakota. You think they're listening to this? Um, uh, anyways, sorry, Kelsey. Uh, Pinkerilla is your choice then for the discount? No, I have a 100% discount. Oh, why would I? Five finger, why would no I, doubt. Why would I need that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the boring answer is like grocery store or something. But I, honestly, I think it would be like, it might be like a clothing store or something. So I could just have like more cool clothes more often. Mm. I don't want to be wasteful, though. So I'd have to find a way to like, you know, sustainably re-gift the clothes or, or thrift them or something. But um, yeah. yeah, only just get like a big group of friends and a social scene. But it's just people who are exactly your height and weight. And then it'll be really cool. I, you know what? To have a little pack of us running around, like <laughs> tiny little 410 gremlins, I. <laughs> Scampering you've given across me something rooftops. To aspire to. It'd be cool. Like really Monster that. Hunter Niantic game. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, by the way, somebody wrote in, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't read it, but I thought it was an interesting point where they said, I can't believe that Niantic made a Pikmin game. Uh, instead of making a Splatoon based game. Cause like, can you imagine a Splatoon Pokemon Go where it's like different regions oh, covered in paint? Be, that'd be Ingress. Yeah, but You're imagine like, Ingress with like a cool paint cover filter yeah. over it. It'd be sweet. Maybe. Then you'd have people zigzagging across the street though to, use, like, <laughs> to paint the roads. Yeah, that's tough. Who's uh, going to paint the highway? Yeah. Uh, what do y'all like for a question of the week? I like, I like the, the dad uh, games. 
Oh, really? Yeah, oh, I thought that's you were going to say that. too. Yeah. I like dad games. I like the bashing the game's visuals. I like the Z axis. Brian defending the Z axis. That's good specific content. Jeff, how are you feeling? I like the dad games. We learned a lot about all of our dads during that. Which week. is the most important thing in life. Uh, congratulations, Gatlin Machine, and shout out to SOCOM on PS2 for winning this week's question of the week here at MinMax. Uh, you just won the prize for my mate, but. Uh, now it's time for something that we prefer to call Get a Load of This. Hey, get a load of this. Uh, the Oscars uh, happened on Sunday, if you tuned in. Um, and I, I always like seeing Jimmy Kimmel's approach. I think I think he's creative and fun for how he's handling these things as, as host. And I watched an interview with him and Ted Koppel. Ted Koppel interviewed him about like preparing for the Oscars hosting gig and all this stuff. Um, and at some point, Ted Koppel was just talking about like how much work it was to prepare for the Oscars. And he's like, well, surely you get a lot of money to compensate for all the work it takes to write all these jokes for the Oscars and all this stuff. And Jimmy Kimmel's like, ah! and he kind of gave one of those. And then the, one of the reasons I love Jimmy Kimmel is then he just said like, Kyle, how much do you think the host of the Oscars gets paid? Based on Jimmy Kimmel uh, giving us ah! 75K. Okay. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel just says, he's like, no, we get 15,000. Fifteen thousand oh, dollars to host yeah, the Oscars. Left, yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah, huh. it's still... a big stage for fifteen thousand. Not like it, I'd just be nervous to mess it up for only fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> that's a good I guess, way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's like, well, you're gonna do it for the publicity, and that's that's something. That's still a lot of money. But if you're making, I don't know, fifteen million a year, like Jimmy you're Kimmel, you're gonna is, do it. You're gonna do it for all the tweets that are like, "Why didn't John Mulaney host the Oscars?" <laughs> right. His Field of Dreams joke was really funny. Uh, get a load of this. Uh, ben, do you know who the Minnesota Twins are? I am familiar with them. It's like okay. Danny DeVito, I think. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Short okay. uh, the Minnesota Twins are using Morshu, the shopkeeper from uh, Link in the Faces of Evil, as part of their little, like, screen Wait, display when they show you when they ask what? you like to please follow the rules of the ballpark whoa it's got it's got other stuff in it too there's a bunch of just like little weird little memes and stuff but yeah the, you got a, a full animation of Morshu telling you you know not to swear at the ballpark and to report unwanted behavior is he even like popular as a meme like we're talking deep cuts right it's a deep <laughs> cut i mean he was he was youtube poop popular which you know for of a certain age i guess that's that's something but like okay. it's it's a deep cut that's awesome there you go Kyle something to bond with your father about <laughs> that's right <laughs> throw it on the pile <laughs> uh. Uh, hey, uh, get a load of this. I I think I mentioned this on the Like a Dragon uh, spoiler uh, video that we did recently. So apologies if I'm, I'm doubling up here. But um, there's a character in uh, Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth who is like obsessed with Japanese culture and he has like tattoos all over his arm. And he's like he's basically like he's basically a, a racist jerk. Uh, in the game, and there's like a funny series of missions related to him. But uh, John Ricciardi over at Aid 4 Play uh, translated his tattoos, and he said that they say mosquito coil and parent teacher student meeting. <laughs> okay, cool. so that, was, that was very funny, and also like not a joke that they could possibly. I don't know how they could even deliver that to American players. Yeah, you, you know, can. like it's like the, the only way to know that joke is is uh, John Ricciardi putting it on on Blue Sky. <laughs> Love it. Should I get on Blue Sky? Is it good? It's fine. Okay. It's fine. Do you miss how much do you miss Twitter? I don't not know. at all. Honestly, not <laughs> at all. <laughs> it's a gift. <laughs> Uh, get a load of this. This is a PC Gamer article. Uh, they had some hard-hitting news here that they figured out. Um, it has been confirmed that there's a big update, 1.6 update for Stardew Valley coming out. And they confirmed with the creator, Eric Barone, that there's a fix in it um, that fixes... It, it fixes one of the animation speeds in it. But basically what it did was confirm an eight-year kind of rumor and theory that if you harvest from left to right, if you harvest your crops from left to right, it's a hundred milliseconds faster than if you harvest <laughs> right to left because, the, because the animation is slightly off. And so someone figured this out a few years ago, they were doing a test um, with a, with seven, seven blueberry plants that they, that they harvested both ways from left to right. It took 11.11 .11 seconds 
from right to left, it took 13.11 seconds. Um, and, and the PC Gamer article brings this up because if everyone who bought a copy of the game just did that seven row harvest, it equals 694 days or nearly two years worth of save time Perfect. at this update. Because when he updates it, he says he's going to make the, the right to left speed up to match the left to right. Um, and so this is all very big Stardew Valley new, news for nerds. That's perfect. I love it. Uh, do you have one yes. from the community too there, Jeff? I do. This made me giggle a little um, right before we started filming. But this is from Dan Duran. Um, it's, it's a Guinness World Records video of the most finger snaps in one minute. Um, and Dan Duran's message... <laughs> When he posted it, says, I got uncomfortable watching this by 25 seconds. I wonder when that hits for others. Um, and it it was it was about 20 seconds in, I think, that I started giggling because it looks very, okay, very stupid. Links yes. below. Tell us your time for when that makes you laugh, everybody. All right. I think that's it for this episode of the MinMax Show. Thanks so much for watching or listening, sharing, all that fun stuff. Uh, other stuff we have going on at MinMax. I forgot to mention it last week, but we had a new MinMax interview go up uh, that was fun, which is with the creators of the One Up Show, uh, one of the most important uh, internet series for me. Uh, huge influence, uh, One Up overall, and the One Up Show is, is a big component of that. And so we had a interview with Area 5 talking about their work uh, creating the documentary about the making of The Last of Us Part 2 and kind of the crunch they went through to develop the one-up show each and every week back in the day from like 2005 to 2008. Uh, so if you're a geek for one-up, check out that interview. I promise you'll enjoy it. Also, uh, New Show Plus news, you might recall uh, that Thirst Council was dominating the polls on Patreon and people said we'd never get away from Thirst Council, but we defeated it with a new episode of Game Query, which was Haley and Leo's uh, old podcast I did with Blake Hester, who was on the podcast a couple weeks ago, and then also AJ Mosier. And so they revived that for a one-off that's on our YouTube channel, also in that bonus podcast feed, along with Bonus Pod, the show that Haley continues to knock out of the park. Um, but now, that was dethroned by a show called Spiciest Interview, which is Leo Vader channeling his inner Sean Evans from Hot Ones, and the first episode is him interviewing Haley McLean as she eats the whole spice range from hot ones for her chicken wings and it's absurd and fun so you can check that out on youtube uh and kyle i don't know if you caught it yet you i assume you watch a lot of hot ones a decent amount yeah okay kyle or leo has <laughs> perfected the delivery of those sean evans lines and like just in the end in particular i made it a clip on on twitter and on instagram and stuff and tiktok but like his delivery of a line at the end of that I rewatched it so many Point. times. Point it makes me laugh. Yes, just just watch Leo's delivery of that. It <laughs> oh, is God. unbelievable. Yeah. Love uh, it. Uh, also, uh, GDC is coming up next week. And so a lot of us are going to be at GDC here. And so there's not going to be a new episode of New Show Plus. There's not going to be a poll for New Show Plus, but we'll pick up where we left off for the week after that. But we will have, in its stead, New Show Overflow, which is uh, if we hit those goals on Twitch, the 300 subs, then we revive a rejected idea for New Show Plus. And so the idea we revived was called Anything But GameStop. No offense, Kyle. Um, where it was uh, Dan Reichert going retro video game shopping and then Kelsey Lewin and I jumping in and Kelsey uh, filling us all in with her knowledge of the retro game scene and running a video game store. So if you like retro games and knowledge of running a game store, Kelsey, I'd imagine you can't do better than that episode of New Show Overflow. And I'd, I'd love to geek out more about it. So There we go. It's going to be up on YouTube next week here at MinMax. But also because of GDC, um, I wanted to point out that, yeah, so Haley and Leo and Janet and I are going to be out in San Francisco next week for GDC. We'll have a regular episode of the podcast because I'm technically coming home Wednesday. The episode's probably not going to record until that Thursday, I guess. So a one day delay if you're a Patreon supporter for the podcast next week. But uh, a small twist to here, which is frustrating. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we are changing the location of the MinMax Community Meetup. So we're still having the MinMax Community Meetup in San Francisco on Sunday, March 17th, 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific. Um, it is now going to be at the Tempest Bar 
Tempest is the name of the bar. It's not too far from Moscone Center. So we're going to be there instead of the bar called Louis. So if you're listening to this, please, for the love of God, go to Tempest instead of Louis for the community meetup. Uh, you don't need to be a Patreon supporter to come by and say hi, but we have a little spot on like a, a stage at the bar called Tempest. So come by and say hello to us, please. Um, also, uh, next week is going to be a little bit different for us because we'll technically be devoid of Jeffum. It's true. Starting to do the void? Yeah. Uh, Jeffum, um, I know you said it before. Into the void. Yeah, but uh, you are out on paternity leave starting this weekend. Uh-oh. Or right, or <laughs> right now, is, immediately. That is bizarre timing. <laughs> Hang on, let him collect his thoughts. He's going to pause <laughs> and think about what this oh, means yeah. to him. Uh, he's really thinking about it. He is <laughs> eager to get on this paternity leave. In fact, he just is jumping out he right took a now. Nap. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> that's fine. Anybody else got anything they want to plug while Jeff collects himself? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, that's cool. Oh wait, here I got one. I yeah. made a video over at Game Informer that it was uh, we pl- we compared the segue from Like a Dragon to the segue in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Yeah. And it's about, it is the closest I have gotten to doing another six stunts video in okay. a long time. I like that video. I, I, I hope more people watch it. It was, it was, yeah, I like how it came out. That's sweet. It's on Game Informer's YouTube channel and all that stuff. Um, well, while Jeffum is <laughs> napping here and his computer's frozen, yeah, he'll be out on paternity leave for the next two months. Uh, so he will be returning after two months, but he needs to go focus on some family for a long time. And nobody could ever fill his spot for those two months. But stay tuned. There might be a temporary uh, somebody <laughs> filling, filling a spot, but not but doing it nearly as well. we're going to try anyway. <laughs> we're we're going to sure as hell try. Uh, thank you to everybody who supports MinMax on Patreon. Thank you to everybody at the Game Champion tier, the $50 tier. You can choose any game under the sun and be declared its champion. And Manifest Echo is the champion of Scarlet Hollow. Interesting choice. Ooh, here we go. Malcolm Holiday is the champion of Odin Sphere Ooh. after Vanilla Ware's Heart. Joel Husselman is the champion of Skies of Arcadia. Uh, Procyon number six is the champion of Ghost of Tsushima. Thanks to everybody for being at that tier, choosing a game to become the champion of. And I think with Jeff I'm bowing out early, that is it for this episode of the Min Max Show. So thank you so much, everybody, for watching and listening. And we'll be back next week with an exciting episode. Thanks so much, folks. Be good, have fun, let's go! Oh wait, Jeff is back! (laughs) Wait, Jeff is back, everybody! Hang on, is he coming back? He... He did message us to say his computer froze. Hey! Hey! Perfect timing. My computer heard you and went straight to the void. (laughs) Your computer went on paternity leave. All right, Jeff, (laughs) now's your chance to really send it off. How are you feeling about being another daddy? You're double the daddy now, right? Uh, it's... So bewildering. We we are so not ready yet. Um, but but like the whole time we felt like, well, we've done this once, so you know, n- no problem. And it's like, oh wait, I have to figure out where our baby car seat is and figure out how to get it in the car with the other car seat and get cribs and diapers and all those other fun stuff. So it's gonna be busy and fun and exhausting and you know, great. It's going to be so sweet. Uh, and now this kid is closer in age to my kid, so they can be best friends. And then my kid that's can true. hate your older kid and everything will be perfect in the world. Yeah, that sounds perfect. That sounds great. Uh, well, congratulations again, Jeff. Um, hats off uh, to you and the wife and the little kid. Uh, enjoy it, man. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Great. And we'll see you in two months. Uh, do you want to do the sign off then? Be good. Let's fun. Have go babies. <laughs> I'm already exhausted. <laughs> <laughs>